welcome everyone. Uh, you may recall that two weeks ago we had a special meeting to discuss the reopening of school under um, conditions of COVID-19. Um, that was a special meeting. Today, the, uh, the same topic occupies a big part of our agenda, but it's a regular board meeting, which means that once again, everything is fair game. So um, in terms of uh, agenda revisions, um, I'd like to add, if there's no objection, an item 3.3 under board operations um, at the request of George Gross, Lindy Johnson, and others um, the, of an in-person board meeting with remote option. Um, so that's 3.3. One other major event that has um, taken place since our last meeting was the announcement of the Supreme, the Vermont Supreme Court's decision um, by a three to two margin to reject the Athens et al. appeal from the State Board of Education's decision to force the involuntary consolidation of school districts. Um, some of you old timers may remember that, um, that actually uh, a number of our school districts, our town, our precursor town school districts were um, parties, were plaintiffs um, to, in that appeal, as were a number of us personally. So um, I would propose that uh, since this event unfreezes a number of issues that had been in suspended animation while uh, we were awaiting the decision, I would um, open up future agenda items to anything that board members wish to include in that regard um, later on. I don't know. Hello? So anyway, future agenda items, we we'll just um, deal with that, uh, as well as any other future agenda items that people have in mind. So um, uh, any other agenda revisions from other board members? Yeah. Flora? It's got a uh, possible in, I don't know, future possible, a uh, future meeting next Wednesday, special meeting. So will we put that under bar operations? Yeah, let's do that. Let's put that under board operations as 3.4, possible special board meeting. Yeah. And one last thing, uh, Jill will be late. Uh, she's in another meeting and will be running a few minutes late, but she will be joining us. Great, thanks for that, Fleur. Good. Uh, anyone else? Agenda revisions, no? Okay, let's then move on to public comments. I know that there are a number of members of the public and we're very happy that you're here. Um, Corinne, I see your hand up. Hey there, Scott and the rest of you. Um, the, some of you or all of you may have seen an email that I had sent to Scott this morning. Um, I'm certainly not gonna take the time to make all the comments I have, but I would like to start off by saying I was a bit taken aback on Monday to see a front porch forum post that started um, started discussion with the public, with widespread public, as far as what the plans are for the fall when that hasn't even been discussed at a board meeting yet. At the last board meeting at the tail end, I had asked when we would start hearing those plans and I was told tonight was the night. So to see a post go out to the public without there being a board meeting to discuss it when the board is ultimately responsible really took me aback. Um, I also have many other um, questions, comments, concerns. I kind of tied in with that, even though I don't think that should have been posted. It also bothered me that apparently Front Porch Forum was the only place it was posted. And if it was something that truly needed to get out, which again, I don't think it did, but if it truly needed to get out, it needed to be also on the school websites and on 
the Facebook feeds and in other places. And I hope that going forward, communications that are trying to get the word out to people will work that way. And I understand that there's a way to get in touch with parents as far as um, emails and phone systems and so forth. But we're talking about also needing to communicate with the public, with our communities at large, potentially new people in the district that want to know what's happening or people that are considering coming to our district. So I really think there needs to be a much more cohesive um, plan in communication. Um, there are one or two other quick things that I wanna mention. And as I say, I have lots, but I'm hoping that some of them will be addressed tonight or um, it'll happen at a, at a future soon meeting. But one question I have is in considering bringing back staff and students, will there be widespread testing for everyone before or as this happens? Because as we all know, many can be asymptomatic. And it would seem like if we're gonna bring hundreds of people together, that there would need to be testing to make this happen. Um, all kinds of other questions, wondering if um, subs have been called to see if people have, who typically sub um, are interested and available this year, if we would be open to having subs who sub in other districts, um, if our own teachers, um, if we want them teaching at multiple schools, whether in our own district or if we have any part-time staff, if we're good with them also teaching elsewhere. My questions go on and on, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Corinne. Um, I think what we'll do is uh, just take it on board, uh, your remarks and your questions, and then address them when we get to that particular part of the agenda. And, and I think uh, in, in every case of um, the major points that you've mentioned will be touched on at least indirectly. Thank you. Um, other, other public uh, comments, please, uh, if you're if you're visible, uh, if your video is on, raise your hand. Um, and otherwise, uh, I see David Lawrence. Yes. Hi, uh, David Lawrence from Middlesex. One quick side comment, though. Who's ever on the phone on seven eight seven one? You probably want to mute. Um, but apart from that, uh, I actually have also a lot of questions, but I won't take up time with them right now. I do have one kind of overall context question that I'd like to understand, though. At the last meeting, it, it seemed to be a foregone conclusion that we were going to be having in-person school. The one thing that I've been unclear on, is this a mandate that comes from somewhere above, or does the board have the possibility, have the power to make its own decision to, to say either go or no go on in-person school? So I, I'd just like to have that question answered and I'll, right. I'll say yeah. all my stuff for more appropriate times in the meeting. Thank you, David. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll definitely get to that and we'll, um, we'll answer that question as to the nature of that um, mandate or whatever it is. Um, other public comments? Uh, hands raised or, or clear your throat loudly if, um, if you don't have a video. Um, okay, uh, I'm not hearing anything and not seeing any hands. So uh, let's move on to student report. Although I'm not sure if we have Towns de Groot here today. Um, I'm not seeing Towns. And I'm hoping that Mia is enjoying her summer. Good. She is, she's a practice. Excellent, so, yeah. excellent. Happy to hear it. Our student representative, Emerita. Um, so, okay, board operations then. 3.1, replacement board members for Middlesex and Worcester. Um, uh, Chris? Um, yes. Do you have any uh, any leads? 
Um, I do not. But what I was going to suggest that we do is set out, um, and, and I, I would do this uh, with the board's um, permission, is just set out a um, request for a front porch forum looking for applicants and put in a soft deadline just to spur uh, individuals who might be interested on uh, and direct them to write a, uh, a letter of interest to the board, directing it to the chair. So we can take it up um, at a time certain. And the purpose of establishing at least a soft deadline, it's soft if no one applies, um, that is to give a, everyone a fair opportunity to respond by a date certain and after which we would consider candidates if we got this, um, letters of interest. Great. And I was um, suggesting about a two, two to three week deadline from now. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, any any <laughs> comments on that? Um, yes, Diane, and then Dorothy. So um, I believe part of the process, but I could be wrong, but I know this is what happened um, <clears throat> earlier when I first came on, was that we need to be doing it collaboratively with the select board. I believe that's part of the new um, expectation. So at what point does, does that happen? Um, Dan, I, what I'll do is I'll look at the statute um, and whatever it requires me to do, I'll do in terms of contacting and working with the select board. I think it could, um, Fleur and then Dorothy and then Jonas. I mean, okay. no, Just Dorothy and sorry, yeah. I, I I meant Dorothy and then Fleur and then Jonas, if that's okay. Yeah. Sorry, Fleur. All, yeah. all I want to suggest is that since this rep has to come from Middlesex, I should suggest using. Um, I noticed that uh, Casey is sending out newsletters to the parents, and also I think Middlesex has other ways of contacting their. Um, their residents. And so since it's basically has to be a Middlesex resident, um, uh, we need more than one way to tell people this besides front porch forum. Great. Thanks, Dorothy. Floor. It, so uh, two things uh, just to answer uh, Chris's question. Uh, so we the process that we used the last time, because we have not just Middlesex, but uh, Worcester community also needing um, a member was the uh, central office. And it could be with a little description from each town, but uh, central office put out a request for letters of interest for to the board, or, or you could post something. Scott, because we're looking for two people. And then as far as the select board is once we have letters of interest, we, so we, uh, I, I went to the Berlin uh, select board and all you do is that you, you ask them if they have a problem with the person that we're recommending for, for the board and, and they have to say yes or, or no, but we have the burden of bringing somebody forward to, to, to them. So that, that's how we did it the last time. And you were part of this, Scott, too. And I attended Berlin because you had to be at the other town. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Floor. Um, Jonas? No, Floor covered it. Floor covered it. Great. Yeah. Um, she did indeed. Uh, the, this is actually one of those, um, one of those unfrozen issues from Act 46 that um, this may be a good point to go over. Uh, in when we had individual elementary school districts, town-based, um, it, it always seemed very simple and straightforward. Um, the recruiting of new board members, except perhaps in Berlin, but um, it, it was a fairly uh, natural process. And I think I, I would love it if board members would sort of um, reflect on how we might develop something, um, some sort of recruitment uh, pool. Um, typically, uh, my natural tendency is to look at the, at the uh, members of the public who happen to um, be here and uh, to, <laughs> Um, maybe start fishing first in, in those waters. But, um, but I think it would be great if we could somehow 
uh, develop uh, the talent, and there's tremendous talent throughout all our towns, um, that we can then be able to encourage to join at, at times that are convenient or um, opportune for them. So I'm not saying come up with ideas now, um, just be very interested in um, perhaps at a future meeting, if, if you have ideas of that nature, um, it would be great. Um, and if anybody does have ideas now, that would be okay too. Otherwise, we can, um, we can move on. Uh, Jonas, yes. Yeah, I, um, at, at some point, this might not be the right uh, time for this, maybe when we start talking, maybe when we get to 3.3, um, but to discuss the possibility of, of reverting back. Uh, sorry, Jonas, the possibility of reverting back? To a 10-member board. Uh. Okay. I agree that that's worth talking about, at, uh, not right now, but I, I would support adding that to the agenda and having that conversation. Okay, wow. Um, that's uh, an articles of agreement change that we would then have to, um, uh, have to make. Uh, that's doable though. Yeah. Uh, I believe, yeah. Chris, um, am I right about that? Was I, that? I think so. I think it would have to be voted upon by the uh, electorate though. Um, right. Because they voted it in, and they could amend, we could present an amendment and uh, have the electorate vote on it. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I, I see your hand up, and then Dorothy. To go back for a moment to the replacement board members from Middlesex, Worcester. Um, I'm not advocating for any particular method, but whatever method is used, I would strongly suggest be uniform and be the same for both towns. It shouldn't be because Chris is from Middlesex, he does something and someone else is from Worcester, they do something. This is one board for one district. We should have exactly the same process and procedure for a, a new board member to come on board, no matter where they're from. We can certainly take advantage of Chris's generous offer to distribute information. I'm not suggesting that's not correct, but I think it's very crucial that we have one process that's identical in every town. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Dorothy. Um, if we want to do that, um, the cheapest time to have a vote would be on the November election day. So we'd have to work back from that date to see what kind of warnings and things we would need to do in order to reduce it back to a 10 member board. And that would take a little time. We don't need to spend tonight. Right, okay, thank you very yeah. much. Um, we'll Scott, forward. I just wanted to, um, yes. I, I think we, so I'm so sorry. I think we got, um, I saw a question on the chat about why. So I just wanted to be on record. The reason I'm interested in it is because as we're seeing how hard it is to keep a, a complement of three members. So Worcester has been only represented by two people. We had trouble recruiting for Berlin. So my personal concern is that we're not going to be able to recruit for three people for all towns at all times, which leaves those towns somewhat disadvantaged. So that's my thinking and my interest, just to be on the record about, about the interest. So I don't want to debate it now. I just wanted to, I think I that's the rationale in favor. Understood, Joe. Thank you very much. And, and I might just, um, take a moment to comment that, uh, Dave, you did exactly what I hope members of the public will do. Since we can't have the public weighing in during the debate part um, verbally, but if you put your comments in the chat box, they're on the record and um, you know we can address the question and it will inform the debate. So um, thanks for doing that as a matter of course. Uh, any, anything else on this before we move on? If not, um, let's go to 3.2, VSBA, VSA virtual conference, page three. Um, this looks very interesting. And uh, Fleur, I, I don't know if you wanna say anything about this. I 
if you're okay with it, I, I would love, yeah, I think we should put a team together. I don't think that we necessarily all have to open our calendar, but put a team together that includes superintendent, principals interested or, or teachers and send a, send a virtual team to attend the, the conference or, you know, I, I, I think it's worth it is to, I believe it's $250 for however many uh, people. And I, I think it would be really important for us to participate on, on this. Uh. Um, yeah, uh, board member reactions. Does anybody object to this? To Flora's suggestion? A virtual team. It's a good, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, may I just ask, what does a virtual team look like? Is it like us here? It's a virtual meeting, so it has to be a virtual team. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So yeah. what I was suggesting <laughs> is that it would be good to have a variety of people. It wouldn't necessarily have to be yeah. just board members. It would be, right. I think it's how we could probably take the best out of it, because it would be more of a diversity of thought around different issues in our schools. So we would be all taking, you know, we all have different perspectives. The board hat is way different than a principal's hat or a superintendent's hat. So that, that was is just a suggestion. That's, I know that's how some other districts are, are doing it. I, unless we are, all the board members are interested in going, that's okay too, it's, there, there's no limit on the amount. Hey, Brian, do you have a... Uh, I mean, I, I know. Uh, you know I'm again. I'm, I'm the the newbie here, uh, but uh, I know that the uh, VSA did send me something, uh, and uh, I was looking at you know, looking at the uh, agenda, uh, and I do know that they are inviting members of the board. So if there's board members who want to uh, attend, uh, if you want to, I don't know if you want to send send it, send me uh, email me, give me a quick email, or let me know. Uh, and I'll uh, make sure you get signed up, and I'll get I'll send you the information. Great, thank you very much. Um, any other uh, board member comments on this? Questions? If not, we will move to th the three point three, the new three point three, regarding the possibility of in person board meetings with remote. Um, with option for remote connection. Um, George raised this with me um, uh, and Lindy also separately and um, others have, have asked the question and um, one, is, one has heard a lot, if, if schools are reopening, what about boards? So um, the question is whether there is some sort of um, physical format in which we can meet um, with the possibility of those who are unable to. Um, and in this, I think we're just a microcosm of, of, the, um, of our community. Um, there will always be those who can't, uh, who can't join, um, but uh, who can't join in person, but who can join um, by, uh, via internet, via Zoom. Um, is that, can that be arranged? I guess is the question. Um, Floor and then Lindy. If, but I guess I let Lindy talk because I've talked and I, I do have an opinion about this and I'll go after her. Great, Lindy and then Floor. <laughs> the article that I shared was not so much that I thought we need to meet in person as we need to be considering the appearance isn't the right word, but if we're expecting large groups of people to convene in schools and we aren't willing to meet in person, that doesn't send a very good message that we believe everything is safe enough for our children and our teachers. So I wanted it to be a discussion versus um, me having the opinion, which I, I don't have a problem with it, but that wasn't really my purpose, but going across social media and other avenues as an educator, I'm getting a lot of uh, things shared with about, you expect my kids to go back to school, but you aren't willing to meet or do things in person. Um, my son who works remote right now was just told they are remote till July 11th, I mean, January 11th. Um, and that's with a pretty big corporation. So I just, I feel like that's why I was sharing that information. 
Thanks, Lindy. Floor. It, so I, I gotta say that I, I totally respect that, that opinion. I think we had some guidance before from the VSBA that we limited the amount of meetings in, in person. I, I have no problem meeting in person, but I also wanna say that it, the guidance came from limiting who goes. The state guidance is to limit who goes into our schools. So we don't wanna have, we are 15 members meeting every other week at U32 with different, you know, like different professions that are completely open or so are open. So I think maybe there's a hybrid, I'm, I'm willing to do a hybrid model, but I also don't wanna put extra stuff on the staff that now you have 15 people that have different ways of taking care of themselves to keep contract tracing for, for them. So I, I was seeing it more as uh, safety and care for the kids and the staff. But personally, I'm, I'm willing to, to meet and maybe we could have, a, if it would feel good for, for everybody have either part of the, the board that feels comfortable meets in person with the necessary precautions and then the other part joins by Zoom but we have to be equitable also to the public, right? So once we start meeting, then we are opening it to the public too. And maybe there's a way to make that work, but I'd rather put less, uh, more, less worry on the staff uh, again. So if we can be efficient, <laughs> you know, I don't know, I'll stop talking now, but that's no, no, just no. My, um, my- Appreciate that. Thank you, Flor. Um, other, other views, board members? about the possibility of meeting in person? Jill? Yeah, Scott, this this is Jill. So I, I definitely get the sort of, um, that the, the I think that it's really a sort of a, a fairness question that, that people are raising about, you know, if, if we open school, why, why wouldn't a board meet in person? But just looking at it from my public health and healthcare lens, it, it doesn't make our community safer to have more people in the buildings and meeting in person. It, it, that is not actually supportive of the public health need to, to reduce um, everybody's exposure at, at all times. We've all, we all need to try to keep our budgets low uh, on that front so that we're um, you know, not doing more than we need to. So I don't think hospital boards are meeting at this time in person. You know, nurses and doctors are working, but hospital boards are not meeting in person so that we have a community-wide approach to reducing unnecessary interaction. So that's, that's the lens I'm looking at it through um, rather than what am I willing to do? If we meet in person, I am willing to show up, but um, I, I don't think it's more protective of either students or teachers for us to do so. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Um, I, I, yeah, there was an unmuted mic, I think, before. Um, if we can sort of observe mute discipline um, as much as possible. I will try to do so as well with my house full of um, young adults. Uh, so uh, other, other views of this. Um, may I ask Brian, is it, is it just um, physically possible? Can it be arranged? Well, so I'm going to make sure you can hear me. So I, uh, so I was thinking about it. I know I, I, uh, I've also been hearing that that uh, question about you know the schools are reopening, uh, and should should you know well, I heard about it. I heard the same thing about central office. Uh, why isn't central office completely opened? Why isn't uh, board meeting in person? I, I have heard those types of things, and I do know that those are. Uh, you know, interesting topics to talk about. Uh, the One of the questions comes down to is uh, definitely public health, uh, public health, uh, and what is, what is the guidance for board meetings? I haven't seen guidance being issued. I'm not sure if we will see guidance being issued. Uh, I, did, I did hear that uh, our state of emergency now has been extended by the governor till August 15th. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, uh, we are also trying to get a COVID-19 coordinator uh, who has a medical background, uh, and we, I've also been working to uh, find a, a, a pediatrician to also uh, work work with our district at no cost on a voluntary basis. And uh, I'll have more information about that uh, in the near future for the board. Uh, but, but these are types of questions that we could either reach out to public health. I could reach out to public health and try to find out more information for the board. Uh, also, maybe if also reaching out to legal counsel to see uh, what is within the legal guidelines. Uh, and I, and I, have, I have to say that this kind of thing that we're talking about is uh, something that we're pretty much dealing with on a regular basis when we're looking at the guidance from uh, 
reopening guidance for schools. What is possible? What does the public health experts say? Uh, what does legal say? Because uh, because there are a lot of questions in regards to that. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Stephen, look. Um, so I, I'm kind of modeling what I say year after um, what what I see from the state and the governor and announcements and that kind of thing. That it, it might seem appropriate for the board, um, and it could be uh, with support and guidance from Brian or others. Um, so likely a subcommittee but for the board to establish criteria, which would need to be met for the board to then begin holding in-person meetings again. So I'm, I'm just making stuff up. I'm not suggesting at all what it is, but that you know the test positive rate has to be a certain percent, or uh, there are certain conditions on the school from the state that would need to be in place or any number of criteria, but to make it easier for us and for the public to understand this is what this is the criteria that we're waiting for before we did, before we go into public meetings again. I don't know what that criteria would be, but I think there could be some reasonable parameters established to say this is what we're looking for and when we see these things happen um, we're we're going to begin holding um, public board meetings again thanks Stephen. Um, yeah uh, Stephen, i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm ready whenever you i can it's my turn i'll, I'll uh, wait go go sorry. ahead jill go ahead jill and, and i think um chris may have wanted to say something too it's hard to tell since he's on the phone, when he wants to speak, but um, yeah, if somebody wants to go before me, please, I'll just absolutely defer. I've said a lot of things. Chris McVeigh, um, if you're there, um, I, you know that you'll speak because she enlightens me all the time, and she might she, this time. She enlightens all of us. Yes, thank you, Jill. Go for it. I, I, I see Kari wants to say something too, but I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so uh, what I was going to suggest is I was going to say I, li I like sort of Stephen's thoughtful approach as always. Um, I also really liked what Brian was saying about consulting with uh, experts. I, I, what I don't think we should do is grapple with this question just as one individual board. I think it's something that we want to do um, in conjunction with other other groups and other other boards and other authorities. I don't, I don't think this should be a, an individual um, you know, district by district um, decision any more than the decision to open schools has been really a district by district. It's really a statewide approach. So um, I think it's sort of a blend of what Brian and Stephen were saying is, is the approach I would suggest for moving forward. Thanks, Joe. Um, Chris and then Kari. So um, as, as much as there, um, it is a public health issue, it's also a perception issue. And if we are deeming it fit for our students and our staff uh, to come into school, uh, we have to be deeming it fit for ourselves to meet in public as well. Uh, I just, it's, it's um, you know, the, the common theme is we're all in this together. Uh, and if that's true, then we are all in it together in terms of opening school. And if students and staff are expected to show up uh, and have um, they're basically meeting in a public in, in a public place. We should be willing to do that too. Um, and I just we can establish all the protocols and try and explain the health um, issues. Uh, and I don't think it would be well received if we're saying the health issues for us mandate that we meet by uh, video, but the health issues otherwise um, have open school. I think we really need to follow and lead by example is what we're willing to uh, asking our staff and our students um, and their parents to do. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I take note also of Dave Lawrence's uh, chat. Uh, Kari. Yeah, just um, reiterating basically what Brian and Jill said. I, I can't believe that every other board school board in the state is also wrestling with this question. So I would I would say let's 
let's do a little research. Let's ask Brian to look into it, the sources he said and any, any others, and just report back and, and we can think about this in the context of, of what the experts advise. Um, Jonas. Uh, I would note that we are not asking students and staff to return to school right now because it's July. We have six weeks until school opens or five. Um, and I would be very disappointed if we were making decisions that affected public health based on optics rather than um, what, you know, what are acceptable uh, and necessary risks to take. Um, it, it seems to be a whole lot more essential and necessary for uh, education to happen, however we can arrange for that, than to make sure that the bunch of us are in the same room. Thanks. Great discussion. Um, does, uh, I, I think where we've landed basically is, um, once again, more work for Brian, but uh, I don't think it's uh, anything that you wouldn't probably be in the, uh, in the midst of doing anyway. Um, Lindy. What I am appreciative of is the conversation because now if people talk to me or ask me, I can say it was discussed, it's being deliberated and looked at and what's going on across the state versus I don't know why we're working remote and you're going back to school or whatever. We've had the discussion, we're looking into it. And I think that's an important part of this as well. I believe all the select board meetings are still remote. Um, so looking at it that way, I am somewhat frustrated with the state of Vermont that it isn't more coordinated across the state and that some districts have put out an AB plan or the person I was kayaking with today said, her superintendent is putting out for um, starting after Labor Day. We need to be more coordinated as a state and have more direction from above, in my opinion, um, and something like this, because you could have kids in one district and you live in another district and you teach in another district. And um, if they're on an A, B schedule and you're on a C, D schedule, and it's, it's going to be impacting a lot of individuals. So I appreciate the conversation about just meeting as a board. Yeah, great. Thanks very much. And thanks for raising it. Stephen Look. Just to Brian, if I can be any help in researching or gathering that information, feel free to contact. Th thank you. I definitely, I definitely will. <laughs> Excellent. Um, are you uh, satisfied, board members, uh, with where we are at this point? Shall we move on to new agenda item 3.4, which is the possibility of a special meeting. Um, uh, Floor, do you wanna, uh, this came out of the finance committee. Do you wanna introduce this or, or Brian? Um, I, I think I would let Brian in, introduce that and it just for timing, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you, Floor. Uh, I, uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, uh, I'm requesting a special meeting for next week. Uh, Pending a, I, I, I want to bring legal counsel in uh, to meet with, uh, I would warn it as an executive session uh, with the board to uh, discuss with the board an executive session uh, with legal counsel uh, what, uh, what has been happening in, uh, what, what other districts are doing in the state of Vermont, what we're allowed to do in the state of Vermont. Uh, and this is really about uh, leave requests that we've been starting to get from teachers. Uh, we've we received a number of leave requests uh, within the last uh, several days. Uh, some teachers are concerned about com not coming to, uh, not worried about coming back to school in the start of the year. And uh, there are, and what are, what what can we do to support our teachers? What can we do to support our students? And it's a very dynamic um, situation uh, with reopening. And, and again, I want to say that again. It's a very dynamic situation. I can go over different examples here, but I don't want to get anyone into rabbit holes right now. But um, there, I, I think it's an important conversation that every board member here needs to uh, to vet and think about. And then I think afterwards we should have that conversation. I believe uh, in public session, so uh, the general public has an idea of some of the complexities that we're facing here with reopening school. Um, and and I do think uh, it, that's. You know, really one of the biggest, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest things about you know, being a member of a board of education and a board, public board, is to really talk about these things and, and invite members of the public to be there. Um, because I do think it's 
something that's very timely, uh, but ultimately um, it, it's been um, very difficult in trying to get the word out there about exactly what we're gonna be doing because we've been waiting for guidance from the state. Uh, one of the things that we were waiting for came today. It was a big deal. It was talking about what uh, we're allowed to do during hy for hybrid learning. Uh, so it was very difficult to put out the, uh, to put things out there to the public that we may or may not have been able to do. Uh, I know there is a, uh, I know uh, some folks uh, talked in the public comments uh, and said they were concerned about communication and, uh, and I can definitely understand that. And I think that that person uh, in particular asked a lot of great questions. Uh, and before, I'm, I'm, I'm always opting out, making sure that whatever we put out there is something that you know, we're comfortable doing and it's been vetted legally, it's been vetted medically, it's been vetted by giving teachers voice on the option, talking to parents. Uh, so we're trying to get that information out uh, with our plan, and we're, we are developing a reopening plan, uh, but I think a lot of the pieces have been hanging in the balance until we got this guidance, which just came out today, literally a few hours ago, uh, from the Agency of Education about the uh, about hybrid learning and what that could look like. I still need to vet it myself, so I, I'm not prepared to talk about it here tonight. Uh, but I would also like to vet it with my leadership team, and again, go through the process of, you know, when you read these long state statute uh, state uh, what does it actually mean? I have a weekly meeting with the uh, Agency of Education officials. I'm sure this will be a big topic uh, later on this week. And uh, making sure whatever we, again, making sure whatever we put out to the uh, public is something uh, that's been vetted uh, on many, multiple angles. Uh, the, uh, so for the special meeting uh, piece, what, you know, really I'm looking for something on possibly next Wednesday. Uh, Six six o'clock uh, special meeting to talk about a per, a, you know personnel or we we can you know, personnel matters uh, executive session with a uh, with our with our legal counsel. I got to make sure the legal counsel is available. Uh, but uh, one, pending the pending the availability of the lawyer uh, to talk with us, you know what are our options? What have we done in the past? Uh, what is what are we obligated to do as as a uh, district? What do we want to do? Maybe do we want to do something more? Do we want to do something just obligated? I mean, these are real serious questions, and uh, I think I think it's it, everyone. I'm going to ask everyone to bring their thinking hats if we can have this meeting next week. Yeah. Brian, if you feel like we need a meeting, I, I I fully support that. I'm happy to come. Wednesday is the best night for me. I do have other commitments on other nights, so I would hope that we could do it on Wednesdays. Yeah. Um, and Brian. Yes. Um, if we if we have a meeting next weekend, I'm all in favor of it as well. Um, can we get materials um, uh, uh, around the questions that we're going to be asked to think about and answer? Uh, because we often get materials like the same day, which doesn't give enough time really to do the thinking and consideration that I think you um, are expecting from us. Uh, okay. So anything that either from uh, you, uh, the state, or um, whatever attorney is going to show up to kind of target and pinpoint what we're going to be really being asked to do and consider would be helpful. And the more time in advance of the meeting, the better for me. Thanks. Okay. I can do that. Sorry. Anybody else? Did I miss a hand up somewhere? Otherwise, um, Mark your calendars, please. Uh, July 22nd, six o'clock. Um, another happy hour with the school board. <laughs> um, all right, so that takes us, uh, if there are no more, um, nothing more on the special meeting to 4.0 and 4.11 school board retreat, uh, which is discussed in a memo on page eight of your packet. Um, Brian? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, uh, of course, obviously, this is all pending what we can and cannot do, you know, and, and obviously consult, we can have to consult with the uh, Department of Health and, and uh, if we are able to have a retreat, I mean, uh, it would prefer, be preferred to have the, have the retreat in person. Uh, you know, the, uh, I put down some ideas on, on the, uh, some things that I'd like the board to consider for it. 
the I know that uh, board member had asked me last uh, last week uh, last time we met what would the cost be and uh, you know, so I did uh, full disclosure I do uh, I have uh, a, one of my uh, folks I know very well is a man named uh, Nicholas Fisher Dr. Fisher I did put a uh, little blurb about him in the uh, board packet about his background he's been a, a, a associate superintendent director of human resources high school teacher real strong background in uh, working in many different types of schools. Uh, he, he, he did graduate. Uh, he has a master's and doctoral degree from Harvard. Uh, he's been uh, basically working in public education his, his entire life. He is uh, someone that uh, I work, I know very well. Uh, he is serving as a mentor to me uh, in my new role here as superintendent. And I thought that it would be great to have him come and meet, meet the board and help serve as a facilitator for our board retreat. The, uh, cost that he has, I thought was very reasonable. Um, so, you know, I, I always joke with uh, uh, Dr. Fisher, and I always say, you know, you know, I can't afford you. <laughs> I can't afford your advice, but and he laughs, but he did give us, uh, I thought a pretty good deal. He said uh, $2,000 uh, for pre-work, the actual work when he comes, and some post-work afterwards re regarding this particular retreat. Uh, you know, so we would have to also pay for travel, lodging, and food, which is uh, what I understand a normal cost uh, for a retreat facilitator. Thanks, Brian. So um, I think the action that the board would need to take based on the discussion we had in the finance committee just prior is uh, a motion to authorize the expenditure of $2,000 plus travel, the cost of travel, food and lodging for um, Nicholas Fisher to facilitate at the board retreat when that happens, and that's still to be determined based on the, um, the doodle poll and uh, <laughs> everything else that's up in the air. Um, so uh, my own, uh, if I may, just um, my own sense of this is we're going to have very few opportunities for board education um, you know, board training during these upcoming months. And this seems like uh, a good opportunity, a good, a good investment um, for us. Uh, so uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm just one board member, but I'm in favor of it. Uh, if anybody else wants to um, first make the motion um, and then Second it, and then we can go from there. So I'll, I'll move your motion as you, do you want me to read it again? Or you, are, sure. do you have it? Go right ahead. Uh, um, Lisa, oh, do you, did you write what? Um, Lisa, did you get it? So I have that floor moved to authorize the expenditure of $2,000 plus travel and lodging expenses. And food. Travel, lodging, and food for Nicholas Fisher to facilitate the board retreat? Yes. Thank um, you. Thanks, so floor moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Thank you Kari. Um, great, uh, so floor moves, Kari seconds. Um, discussion. Diane. Uh, there will still be a, a small group, right, that's planning and working on the retreat. Um, you know, it's just that often, usually there's kind of the focus and then you figure out who's the facilitator or the work and um, and I guess my only concern, and I don't want it to come across that I'm saying, um, you know, you outsiders can't know what we're doing. I'm not trying to say that. I guess my only question or wondering is, Brian, with you being new to new to this state and new to doing this, and then having somebody from outside of this state also facilitating the conversation, I just want to be sure we're clear what we're hoping the conversation will be, so that it's on target for um, for helping us advance what we need to do. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure. Yes, Diane. Uh, and I know that if you look at the uh, packet, you know I put some uh, agenda items down there about some of the things that we that could be discussed. But I agree with you that uh, uh, the subcommittee would have to uh, definitely. I know we have a subcommittee already together, 
and that is uh, Floor and Scott. And uh, the idea is that once, if, if Nick, if you approve Nick tonight, they would, one of the things we could do is start having that conversation uh, with Nick about uh, moving this, moving this, moving this forward. Thanks, Jonas. Uh, yeah, I, I would prefer not to have a facilitator. Not that I don't think uh, you know the the good doctor isn't a perfectly cromulent facilitator. Uh, but last summer, when I met most of uh, the folks here for the first time um, at Scott's favorite place on earth, um, it was you know it was just us and the superintendent and Dave Delcor, um, and I thought it gave us a chance to communicate um, and learn how to communicate together. Um, honestly, Brian, I'd rather have you lead it um, because I'd like to get to know you more and not have that buffer uh, between us. Um, but I certainly wouldn't, you know, veto it or, you know, um, it'll probably, it, it'll be okay. I just wanted to make that, make that point. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I understand the point. I, I really do. Uh, and I, I, and I do have to just, uh, you know, respond to it saying that, uh, Yes, it's probably, it's, I think at some point, uh, in, in my personal opinion, that uh, it's important. At some point, you may want to, you know, I'm hoping to have a nice, long, fruitful tenure here as your superintendent here in Washington Central. Uh, I moved my whole family here. <laughs> We're, uh, you know, 10 minutes away from the uh, from my, from my work, so I, which is a double-edged sword where I can roll out of bed and see, see what's this, how much snow's underground. But uh, I would say that uh, uh, to really, to really, what I think as, as the years go by, it would make more sense to have a uh, retreat um, uh, if, if, with me leading it. Uh, but I think uh, with a, with a new superintendent and a, a dynamic situation, uh, with uh, I think I think it's I, I will tell you uh, this gentleman Nicholas he does not hold any punches. So uh, if if we had a, a a board topic a topic at, at the retreat and he thought I was holding back, uh, there he would he would pull it out of me. I, I, you're He'll definitely pull it out of me is what I'm trying to say. Thanks. Um, other board member comments on this? Joe. Um, thanks. Um, I, so I would be more inclined to have a facilitator um, because I would really like Brian to be able to participate. And just as someone who facilitates a lot of meetings, you, can, you cannot do both. Um, and so uh, that would be my, um, my preference would be to have a facilitator. I, I don't feel strongly about it if others um, don't feel that way, but that's, uh, I, I, I would lean yes on a facilitator. Thanks, Joe. And, and I should just um, draw attention to um, the comments in the chat box, um, both from the public and from um, board members. Uh, other, other discussion? Fleur. I, I, I would like to also have a facilitator. I think in the, in the past we have wanted a facilitator and hasn't always been uh, approached that way. And I think we would grow more as a board. I agree with Jill's comments. We It's a different hat you wear when you facilitate. And I think having somebody that doesn't have as much history on us run the facility where it might made us more honest and see all of us in a different light. So I, th I think it would be an important step for us to you know, move forward, be more creative and think outside the box with somebody that doesn't have as much baggage as, as we bring <laughs> to, to the board. So we can be, you know, just focus on kids and, and growing as that, that would be my vote. So yes, to the facilitator. Thanks, Flor. Uh, are, are there other comments before we move to a vote? Uh, yes, Jonathan. Uh, yes, I, I would uh, also be in favor of, of having an, a, a facilitator as well. I think, as Brian mentioned, there, there are, uh, we're all facing highly unusual times. So, so having someone outside the district, uh, both with a new superintendent coming in and a facilitator, I think would be very beneficial in a lot of ways. Great. Thank you. Um, Dorothy. Um. <clears throat> I, I agree with having a facilitator and, and I agree with, I think with Jill who said how difficult it is to facilitate and be part of the meeting. And I think the point of this meeting is for us to get to know Brian and Brian to get to know us. And as he's having to do two jobs at once, I don't think that's very helpful. And I do think it's good to have somebody 
this totally unconnected, at least so far, to our district. Um, it just, I just think it's a good idea. Thanks, Dorothy. And, and once again, um, the chat box is active, um, which is great. Um, I, if there are no further uh, contributions to the discussion, we can move to a vote. Um, very good. So all in favor of authorizing $2,000 plus travel, lodging, and food um, for the purpose of bringing um, facilitator Nick Fisher as, um, I got the name right, I hope? Yes. Uh, as facilitator to um, the retreat that we hope to have um, some, somewhere down the line. Uh, please click yes or thumbs up or um, whatever. Um, Thing you have, um, I'm seeing. Oh, and, and no, of course, the red X box, X circle rather. Um, and I'm seeing all yeses, I believe. Did I um, did I miss anything? All yeses. Okay, very good. The motion carries. Um, let's move on then to internet access. Hey, just a quick question. Oh yeah, Kari, sorry. I had a few ideas about agenda topics. Should I email those to you and Laura? Absolutely. That would be most welcome. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. And Stephen Luke. Um, I would just request, I'm looking at um, item three in the memorandum, uh, the last sentence. It should include just the board members and the superintendent. I, I appreciate what the desire is. Um, I'd request that... Um, some study be done on the open meeting law and get some legal um, interpretation on that um, be, because it's probably going to have to be warned as a meeting. And if it's warned as a meeting, then the public has to be allowed to attend. All right. Good eye. Thank you, Stephen. Absolutely. Well, and uh, yeah. if it needs to be warned as a meeting, we'll have to warn it as a meeting. Yeah. Um, and gladly, too. Fleur. So I, I just want to say to to speak to Jonas in uh, his concern that this is this is a retreat. That doesn't mean that we can't have a meet and greet with Brian. <laughs> in in my favorite place in the world. If we follow COVID, less than twenty five people, <laughs> you'll have to not sit on the porch though. So we might have to sit further away. Yeah. But, yeah. Got it. Okay. Excellent. Um, great. Okay. Uh, next is internet access, and there's a memo on this on page 10, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, so basically, uh, to, before I start, I just want to thank the board for their support in, uh, in uh, getting the facilitator uh, uh, vote. The, uh, do, 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 so basically, uh, there was a, there's been a huge conversation around the state. I know a board member brought it up at the last meeting. I wanted to also respond to that that uh, that board member just to let let, uh, let her know that um, it, we did that we do have a uh, survey. We've been really trying to take an idea of what our needs are for our children around the uh, around the area. We you know, we have some very we're very rural communities who may not have access to technology, and I know that the state has been uh, also has is aware of that because it's not just it's a really a statewide issue for the. For our children in the state, especially when you go to remote, if you have to go back to remote learning for everyone, um, you know, some children have hard times getting access to uh, the, the, uh, their teachers. So uh, this was just to give you an idea of some of the things that we've done um, uh, and some of, the, some of the areas that we're looking for. Uh, and I, I didn't, you know, I don't want to belabor the point and go through everything piece by piece. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now we are uh, limited in our, our infrastructure, around, but, uh, some some items that we're looking for that we've been giving out the students Chromebooks, uh, looking at about internet services, putting up uh, hotspot devices for AT and T and Verizon, and those carriers uh, to ensure students have accesses. And we've done that for at least uh, uh, some of our children, but there's still a lot more work to be done. And there's not a major so there's not an easy solution at this time. I do know that the state of Vermont is trying to uh, put money 
throw money at the problem uh, and figure out ways that they can get more hotspots in areas where children may not have access. And uh, I, I do know that's something that they've been working on. Keith, Thanks, uh, I know Keith is here. Do you yeah. have anything, uh, anything else to add? Uh, I think that that covers it really pretty well. Um, we are trying to sort of explore all the all the avenues and all the possibilities. Um, like Brian said, the infrastructure in Vermont is just such that um, we're really limited in some cases to to what we can provide at a location. Um, so we are looking into some alternatives. AT and T and Verizon are examples. VTEL is another one. Uh, that's a wireless carrier. Um, we're looking at, you know, the schools provide internet. So the state put out a hotspot map, an open hotspot map uh, back in the spring. Um, those will continue to be available in the fall if they're needed. Um, you know, and, and just in terms of looking at device access as well, um, we were one-to-one uh, -one through all the grade levels. Um, we're looking at what it might take to be able to do that so that we could send a device home with every student if we had to. Um, so we are looking into some of those access issues and that work is ongoing over the summer at this point. And uh, Keith, I know that uh, the AOE has asked for information about uh, information regarding uh, some of our spots where we don't have uh, good access for some of our families and we've been able to provide them with that, that information, correct? Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Lindy. Um, something that happened this spring when it was an emergency was, and I think it was AT&T and Verizon, but it may have been more, where they gave much more data time to people on their phones for free because some children were using their parents' phones. That was their only access. I don't think a lot of these free things that happened in the spring are going to continue to happen. And that was one of the only ways that people could get through. Um, I, I taught in Barry City and Barry Town, and you would think that they would have excellent access because it's so um, not rural. And I was delivering materials to a child who lived right in the city and they didn't have access. And when I told them what I was hearing on those uh, weekly reports, it turns out they had a bad credit problem with Spectrum or one of those that was where they lived and they couldn't access. And they were not comfortable sitting in the McDonald's parking lot even though there was free access in the McDonald's parking lot. You know, so there's all those kinds of stories. And here we are in the rural part where even in our meetings with teachers, with boards, we're going in and out, we're turning off our cameras because we don't have access. So it is a, a real serious issue with the rural nature of where we live and making sure that we can have equal education when we're remote or when we're hybrid. Uh, but I'm just worried about the ones that were made free because it came on so fast in the spring and they people had to do stuff, but the corporations don't have to anymore. Yeah. So we had, <clears throat> We had some discussion about this um, earlier today, actually, at a task force meeting. Um, and one of our agenda items for this week is to reach back out to all of the local carriers and to see what programs they might be offering in the fall or you know, who, pretty much just collecting all that information about will the wireless carriers be doing anything in the fall? Uh, And maybe only if we go back to remote learning, they in the next week or so have that information on hand um, to, to better help our students get online. Thank you, Keith. Um, Lindy is just pointing out that you exemplified the problem just now when you froze. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, also uh, note, Kevin's chat in the chat box. I didn't um, see that, yeah. Good. Uh, other board member comments? Uh, if not, we can move on. Okay. I, I don't, uh, John? 
Yeah, I just maybe this is not a fair assumption to make, but um, is it fair to assume that lack of internet access is um, more of a problem in uh, less uh, affluent parts of the state or not? Because if it is, um, then we have a serious equity issue, particularly as there will be some remote learning as time goes forward. We don't know if it will be only remote learning exclusively, but that's uh, something that I know we're all concerned about is um, ensuring that all of our kids uh, have uh, at least equitable access and, and fair access um, to remote learning because it will be part of the learning in the now and in the future. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Um, uh, any, other, uh, any other board member comments? If not, what I would suggest since it's 707, and I'm, I'm trying to remember to tickets, um, do you want to take a five minute break uh, and we can move on to reopening schools? Okay, fresh and, and fit. So reconvene at 7012. 7.12, please. Thanks. Welcome back, everyone. My clock shows 7.12. Um, hope you had a good stretch. Great. So, um, the next two items on reopening schools and efficiency of Vermont HVAC are both um, are both informational, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, Brian? Uh, yes, uh, there was a, and I do think it's you know good to just mention that there are some you know items that are uh, you know that stand between the goal of getting all students to come back to school uh, in the fall, and uh, you know there are some things that stand between that that goal. And, uh, and the reality of that happening. And I, you know, I think it's good to uh, just put it out there. The uh, Center for Disease Control Guidelines, Vermont Agency of Education Guidelines, the Vermont Department of Health Guidelines, our own local context. So uh, I've only been here for about two weeks now as the superintendent. And I know that we've been, we, the leadership team is doing some amazing work. The task forces that we have working on this uh, which are meeting weekly, are putting some amazing work and ideas together. Uh, we've also been, uh, let me rephrase that, they've been doing amazing work based on the guidelines that we have and that have been coming from us, uh, from the uh, state, uh, from the Agency of Education. Uh, and I'd so, so when we're planning the reopening of school, uh, we have these different guidelines. I've also, uh, I'm asking my, um, my uh, team, the leadership team, to also look at the uh, National Education Association guidelines for reopening, uh, because we also want to make sure that teacher uh, more more the union has its voice in these guidelines. Uh, I've uh, met with uh, some uh, teachers union folks already, discussed the uh, reopening as well, um, and you know we're trying to incorporate the guidelines from all these different agencies into what is going to uh, make sure that our children and staff are safe when we reopen. Uh, the one thing that I have not had a chance to, and I know one of the members of the public brought it up today. Uh, if you go to uh, you know, the last, the bottom of that page, that memorandum, it basically says that uh, you know, our leadership team, our five task forces, we're looking at these uh, guidelines. And uh, you know, while we've given, received these guidelines, and sometimes they're updated and changed on an almost daily basis, uh, one of the things is, uh, what is the local context, right? So this, Board of Education, I wanted to just say, I provided two pieces for the local context uh, to uh, the, the team and the task forces. And those were parents need to go to work and we need to operate within the confines of our budget. And because uh, we don't want to just come up with all these ideas of, you know, spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on things that, you know, sound good, but they're not necessarily really what we need. Uh, everything and every purchase that we're, we're spending money on is going towards addressing a agency of education or Department of Health guideline. Um, and so if there's any other types of um, local guidelines, something else you wanna consider, or if you think that these two need to be re rethought uh, or, or changed or anything, 
please let me know because uh, uh, you know, we're definitely working very hard with the leadership team and the task forces. Thanks, Brian. Um, we do have members of the leadership team here. Uh, I wonder, um, is there anyone you would like to uh, call on specifically to address any of the issues of involved in reopening schools in this connection? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think the uh, the leadership team is here to help as a as a consult. What I was really hoping to see if there was any members of the board. I mean, these two things about parents need to go to work and we need to operate within the confines of our budget. Obviously, in in addition to following all the safety guidelines from the Vermont, Vermont Agency of Education and the Department of Education, uh, yeah, I, the purpose of this was really to get see if there's any any uh, board community. Uh, I know board members, you are you are the community, you represent the community. If there was anything else uh, that you thought should be added or changed or updated in that piece, I think Stephen Luke may have something. Um, I I understand the reality of number one, parents need to go to work, but if it, if I was writing it, I would prefer to see number one is we know that students learn best with an in person experience. I'd like to frame it around what we know is best for students. We need to appreciate, so maybe there's three things, but in my mind, um, what should, within the confines of what's safe, what should be driving the reopening of our schools is that we know students are best served if in, in, um, in the classroom with a teacher. Again, assuming that it's safe, that in my mind, that's what's driving the reopening of schools, the number one thing, because that's what's best gonna serve our students. And I've seen no, I, I, could, I haven't seen everything, but I have seen nothing to suggest there's an advantage to not have an in-person um, learning for the students. So I, I, that's my recommendation. I think that might be, it would be more palatable to me. Okay. Great, Stephen. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, and approbation from uh, other board members as well. Um, other, other board member comments? Uh, anything to, to uh, suggest to Brian? Um, not a suggestion, Scott, but since it has already come up, um, I think yes. if we had clarification on um, what entity is the decision maker on whether school actually opens uh, and what what the time frame is for uh, that, meaning school opening in person, for in-person school, as opposed to remote learning again. Uh, and what the timeline, anticipated timeline is for making that decision. Uh, I think that would be helpful. Yep. So, uh, uh, Chris, I think you make a, a, a great question. Uh, I'm operating under the, uh, under the uh, belief that the state makes that ultimate decision. Uh, the the boards, Board of Educations are formed under the state constitution. Uh, and uh, we are preparing for, for uh, in-person instruction as the state has uh, advised us to prepare for in-person instruction in the fall. Another, another question I'd like to raise is um, the, the various guidelines that you have here are the, um, the CDC guidelines. Uh, and I think it has come out within the past week or two um, that um, the CDC may be modifying its guidelines under political pressure um, so my question is, how do we uh, take that into consideration? Um, and should we rely upon the Department of Health, our own Department of Health, more heavily, or just call Tony Fauci and rely on him um, more, more than the CDC? Um, because and that, that's a serious consideration, in my view, in terms of, because they're quite blank about, oh, the president said the guidelines were too stringent or too expensive. So they're going to revisit them, and I think if we, you know, we want to have faith in the guidelines that we're relying upon in opening schools. So it's a it's a comment and and some, I think something we need to uh, take seriously because of the, I think politic politicization of 
the CDC at this point. Okay. So, so uh, Chris, what I can say is that the uh, uh, the Agency of Education and the Department of Health are continually updating uh, their uh, their information to uh, that they're sending out to superintendents. I share it with my leadership team as soon as I get the information, uh, and so. I am aware that the CDC has, is issuing guidelines. Uh, I, I've, heard, I've heard that before. Uh, I've seen those. I've seen some of those new, new uh, ideas coming through the state. What they're doing, the State Department of Health and Agency of Education are doing, is uh, they're providing more clarification around the guidelines. Uh, and they had now uh, in my in my last meeting with uh, Agency of Education folks and the Department of Health folks, they are answering it answering questions uh, from folks like me who end up getting the folks from, getting questions from general members of the public, members of the board, members of, um, of our leadership team, and we take them back. And I, you find out that a lot of the questions people are asking are being asked across the state different uh, to different superintendents, because a lot of us are asking very similar questions. And uh, the state has advised me in Vermont that they are gonna be updating or providing additional clarification around the guidance that they issued in late June. Uh, in, a, in a frequently asked question page, which they're putting, which they put out last week, and I, they, I was told that they will continue to put those inf that information out and update uh, their guidelines uh, what, based on the health public health information that they have available at the time. Thanks, Brian. Dorothy, um, my, I'm wondering if it comes down to the fact that they say there we will have schools in school operating in the schools. I know that there are many parents who will not send their children to school, and I want to be sure that they then have um, it, making it difficult. I understand for the yep. staff and the teachers, but they have access uh, to distance learning. Um, otherwise, they may do their own homeschooling, in which case we will lose their per pupil, whatever we get from the state. And I also have heard, uh, and I can't tell you where and it somewhat makes sense to me that there are some homeschool kids families who would like to be part of distance learning um, gives them a little more opportunity to be involved and also then those children become part of a distance community but children that they may actually end up going to middle school and high school with I'm thinking more in terms of elementary here but I just wanted to be sure that, that we can assure parents if they are not sending their kids to school, that we will provide distance learning for them. Um, and if we can't, I think that's not good. So uh, Dorothy, you asked the big essential question. Uh, and uh, so, so I wanna, so I'm, I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna answer, try to answer your question. And also I know uh, a member of the public uh, was, uh, I, I guess that, uh, a concern that I had put out a, 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 a letter out earlier this week. And so, so what's, what's happening is uh, the leadership team were, and the task forces are working extremely, extremely hard in trying to put together the, uh, uh, the information and communication plan for, to communicate to our communities and families. And one of the hardest things that we're, we've been grappling with is uh, how many uh, families don't will not come back to school or refuse to come to school or put their children on home instruction? And it was it's been very hard to uh, you know, to, to even take a poll or send out uh, information about what schools are trying to do with regards to the the uh, their schedules uh, because we don't we didn't have that information about what we're really permitted to do uh, based under uh, the, the the guidelines that came out. And so we've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And I know uh, some one of my principals in particular was saying, Brian, we got to put someone out there. And, and, I, and, I, and I agree, and I agree with them. Uh, but at the same time, I was hoping to hear that we would get some guidance around the hybrid learning. And uh, so I know that today, just a few hours ago, we got something. I have not had a chance to review it, review all of it. I have not had a chance to uh, vet it with my leadership team. It's, uh, we're meeting twice a, twice a week uh, for several hours. And then you know, in between those times where uh, continually to ask these types of questions, what we can and cannot do. So I think we're gonna start with this new guidance that came out, we're gonna start being able to get more information out to families in regards to uh, what we're thinking and what we're gonna be able to do. And then I think ultimately we'll be able to identify 
um, that what the, uh, first of all, not just what we can do with remote learning and hybrid learning, but also uh, what, we, what we decide to do here at the, at the district level to support our families. Thank you very much, Brian. And I'll just note George's question in the chat box to Keith. Um, any other board member questions? Uh, Jonas. Um, so this goes back to something I think Corinne said uh, at the beginning, um, her question about testing. And I think that goes directly to uh, Brian, what you just said about how many families are going to you know, be willing or not willing to send their kids back you know, into a building. Um, I saw someone, I forget who it was, um, say that uh, the, the pandemic and the virus allow us to make immediate short-term decisions and long-term decisions, but that medium-term decisions are relatively impossible. Um, and I will, um, I'll, I'll punctuate this with an, with an anecdote. Um, we have a three-year-old um, and last week, we were planning on sending him back to daycare for the first time last Thursday. Um, because the case numbers in Washington County are so low um, and, you know, we figured that, you know, we might as well do this now. You know, we sent our, our nine-year-old to, a, a, to an outdoor summer camp last, uh, last week in Maple Corner, which was just awesome. Um, but we figured we'd do this now and get them some social time, um, you know, you know, if, if and when you know another wave breaks over the state, um, on Wednesday afternoon we got an email from the daycare center saying that a uh, a teacher who had not been in the building since the previous Thursday was sick uh, that Monday and Tuesday with fever and nausea. Um, and my question was, has that person been tested? When will you know the results of that test? And unfortunately, they said we don't know. And the guidance that they'd gotten from the state was that. Um, they can't require a test uh, before someone comes back into the building. They can't require a doctor's note from a sick kid uh, to come back into the building, um, which of course means that if someone was pre-symptomatic, that they would have, you know, they would have been in the building and contagious for up to two weeks, right? The numbers and the data that we are seeing are, you know, a time capsule from what for what's happened in the past one to three weeks. Um, Without, without a credible and overwhelming testing regime, we're not going to have confidence that schools are safe. And the decisions that parents are making about when to send their kids to school and when, you know, when, you know, when that time is, we are making those decisions with really imperfect information. The guidelines that are out there are great for people who are symptomatic. That is the best you can do. Wear masks. If you're symptomatic, isolate, leave the building immediately as soon as possible. And you can return, you know, you know, 48 hours after symptoms go away. But without testing, it, I'll say on Monday, we got another email from the daycare center saying that another two teachers had been sick. I, you know, I have a, I have a kid going into fourth grade at Doty and, um, I love the school. I think the principal is awesome. The faculty and staff have been terrific. Um, and the guidelines that I've seen about safety in schools uh, are all well-intentioned and thoughtful, but without that testing, without knowing who's sick with what, um, that decision becomes incredibly difficult and we will probably err on the side of not sending our kid. You know, we, we did not send Nate to daycare last week where we have nixed that idea because there is no way to be sure. And when, you know, if we make a mistake, like it's already too late before we know it. So Brian, I would love to hear, you know, what you're hearing about testing, what's available, what the infrastructure is, what the protocols are gonna be. And I think most importantly, and again goes to Corinne's concerns, what, what is the communication? What is the communication protocol, right? I would, you know, I would love to see like a daily bulletin Right. There are X number of teachers in these schools who are sick and out X number of students. Right. You don't have to get into HIPAA stuff. You don't have to tell people who they are. But this is the illness that we're dealing with. Right. And we know that, you know, five, you know, the five people who were sick, you know, last week got tested and are cleared. Right. But there needs to be that kind of information sharing. 
at, you know, frequently, constantly. So, uh, Jonas, I, I, mean, I think you, I, you definitely uh, raise all good points there. Uh, you know, testing, you, know, you have your children going to school. I, I understand that. The, uh, the part of the thing is uh, some of these are, some of those questions are, are is one of the reasons why we have to have more uh, interaction with the medical community. Uh, I know that we're going to have a COVID-19 coordinator who's going to be hired. And these are types of questions that I would probably ask uh, him or her, whoever that person will be. Um, and then um, and if they don't know, they would have uh, access to talking to public health nurses. I can tell you that uh, I did find, uh, I have attended some meetings with uh, Dr. Levine and I've seen doc meetings with Dr. Levine and uh, Dr. Holmes from the public health department in Vermont. And they did answer questions in regards to um, uh, 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 some concerns about children going to school. Uh, and what I've heard, and uh, I can even you know, share this with uh, share this uh, with the board uh, at, at some point in the near future, uh, that most of the uh, transmissions, it, it, children are mostly very safe. They're not the ones getting impacted by the uh, disease. Obviously, they, they also did the caveat that they're you know we're learning more about this disease. Uh, but uh, you know it's it was very instructive to me, uh, and so. Uh, so, so I think it, when you hear these public health officials answer these types of questions about the necessity of wearing a cloth mask in school, uh, making sure that uh, you social distance as much as humanly possible, we're practical, uh, it, and, and, you, and we have all these task forces working together, I, I, I would say almost around the clock, about trying to make sure that uh, we have precautions in place. I think the only piece that was holding up a lot of our communication at, uh, was this uh, idea around hybrid learning. So for the last two weeks, we've really been focusing on, you know, purchasing what supplies do we need? Uh, how do we get up, how do we set up isolation rooms? Do we need to purchase plexiglass or barriers to protect people in certain areas of the building? Uh, how do we do, for example, central office, uh, going around to the schools? So we've been focusing on a lot of those types of things while we're waiting, and our principals have been um, very uh, diligent in looking at schedules for their children. Uh, for 100% of students coming back to the building, what it could look like uh, with hybrid learning, uh, which is partially uh, remote learning, but we didn't want to put anything out there yet to parents and families because we didn't know the guidance from the state. And and, and I, I, I firmly believe once you put something out there, it's hard to take back. And so that the uh, thing that went out on Monday, uh, this past Monday to our families, I strongly feel that those are things that we are putting out there because we're putting out there and we pretty feel like we're on solid ground with those areas. Uh, and it also does generate questions. So, I mean, I will say I got a lot of questions about masks and face cover, facial coverings and what's appropriate, what's not. And, uh, you know, these are all conversation ideas that we have to definitely vet more with the leadership team and then with the medical community. And then we can have a better plan to bring out to the public uh, when the time comes. And I think the time is coming. We're getting there uh, as a result of this hybrid learning guidance uh, which just came out today. Uh, sure. We, I'm, I'm sorry, Brian. We still need to know more about testing. We, um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with you. We do. Absolutely. Like all, all of those preventative measures are fantastic. Masks absolutely are essential, mm -hmm. right? But, yep. you know, we, without yeah. testing, like we're sending kids into, you know, we're sending kids and adults into an environment where we're hoping that they don't catch it instead of seeing if the virus is actually there. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and that's, you know, that's not your responsibility. That's largely, you know, to, to Chris's point earlier, that's a federal issue. And there isn't a whole lot we can do about that. Um, but some information, you know, some information, you know, at a future time about what testing protocols and what infrastructure is going to be available, how they will be administered, you know, what people's, what staff and students and families responsibilities will be if someone gets sick, you know, is, absolutely critical. Sorry, Joel. Go ahead, Sean. Um, now I'm, I, I double muted after realizing I, after Jonas pointed out I was hot mic. Um, so thanks, Jonas. Um, so I, I, I absolutely agree with Jonas on his concern about testing. Um, as someone who does nothing but work in healthcare all day long, I can tell you that um, testing is a very hot topic at the Agency of Human Services and in the Department of Health. And um, I have seen various testing plans that are aimed more at the healthcare system and um, the extent to which healthcare providers 
should and uh, will be tested, but also things aimed at the general public about um, who should be tested and the, particularly the question of how much asymptomatic testing uh, should be done. So um, I, I think that this is an area where we really want to look at state guidance. And um, Brian, in terms of your interaction with um, various state leaders, I think making sure that there's at least clear information about what the testing strategy is for schools. Uh, I suspect there will not be enough testing to satisfy um, your concerns, Jonas. That's my guess. Um, we actually do have we are one of the few states in the country that has as much testing as uh, most epidemiologists think we need to have. So we're in better shape here than in lots of places. But um, I, I'm not sure we're going to be, you know, testing lots of, you know, multiple kids and teachers on a regular basis. But that's really a health department decision. And so I think we need them. Uh, we need their guidance and their information on what what the plan is. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, other, uh, other board questions. Did I hear you, Chris? Yeah, you did. Um, and Brian, has there been any, um, contact with the, um, teaching staff about, um, making voluntary testing readily available if they wanted it? So then any teacher or any, uh, student who wanted to be tested would have, um, access to testing at no cost. I have not heard anything in regards to that. Have, has there been any resistance by teacher, by the union um, on, on testing protocols, to um, your knowledge? I, ha I have not had that conversation with uh, uh, teachers union officials here in our district. I, uh, my, my basic, most of my conversation has been making sure that teachers have a voice here in our, uh, in our, 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 our uh, decisions and, and giving their input into uh, uh, making making uh, good decisions for them. I know that uh, we do have uh, the task. We do have over 72 uh, folks that are meeting on a regular basis every week in these five task forces, and our, our leadership team is constantly uh, taking the information uh, and uh, basically uh, synthesizing it, working to uh, vet it. And you know, the big again, the biggest holdup has been the uh, hybrid learning uh, piece, not knowing what we're able to completely do. Until uh, until today, but, but we still need to figure out what that actually read, means because I haven't been able to read it yet. Uh, it just came out a few hours ago, um, and so that's really been most of uh, you know the, most of what we're doing. Uh, I have also shared the NEA guidance document with the um, with the um, uh, leadership team, where we're making sure that I, I understand from talking to other superintendents that that guidance lines up quite well with the. Uh, guidance that we've uh, received uh, earlier in the summer. Um, we are looking at a uh, our we had one of the one of the uh, task forces is the communication task uh, communication and policy task force, uh, and they there is a uh, opportunity we're working together we're working to put together a website which will have lots of the information that I think you know folks uh, like one of the members earlier today. Uh, in the public and asked uh, a lot a lot of questions and uh, I think there'll be a lot more uh, what do you call it um, opportunities to uh, provide answers to those questions uh, and of course sometimes you provide answers and then you get more questions because folks have you know it, it, you, you go deeper into the uh, material so 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 we're looking at uh, having a website uh, we're hoping to also have a uh, area where someone can can like a teacher Parent can uh, post or, or email the uh, send it send an anonymous email or send her an email not hopefully not anonymous but an email to say hey I had a question about face masks or I had a question about isolation rooms or I had a question about and uh, that we're really hoping to uh, come up with that and finalize that protocol at a future uh, leadership meeting uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more information coming out of our plans in the next uh, several days. Uh, so stay tuned in regards to that, and I'm hoping that that will help to address some of the uh, anxiety and concerns that some of the members of the public are feeling. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, we're, we're going to continue to this is we'll just continue to you know chop wood and keep going forward. Okay. Great. Um, Thanks, Brian. Follow up. Sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, just about um, based on the uh, staff participation in these various task force. Uh, has there been a um, 
a primary concern that the staff has raised about uh, returning to school? Uh, well, I mean, I think I think we're we're all we've all been grappling with the uh, uh, my, my leadership team is uh, I had a member of the leadership team on every task force, so I think uh, one of the uh, things that we've heard so far is is the uh, some of the some of the concerns around uh, hybrid learning. Uh, what is that going to look like? Uh, what am I going to when, when we come back to school? How safe are we going to be? You know, those are the types. Of, but I think uh, a lot of people understand we're re working very hard with the precautions uh, that we've been working to develop is going to be very helpful. Um, the um, I'm just trying to think what else. What else can I share right now? The the uh, it, with regards to uh, the leave requests, I think there's a conversation. Of, I think there's some concerns about that that has uh, come up. And which is why I think uh, we definitely want to talk more about that at next week's meeting. Great. Um, and I, I note that in the chat box, the questions continue to spill over. So um, that's part of the, uh, the video record, at least. Um, so uh, if uh, do you feel, um, board members, that you've, have we talked through the, um, the memo on page 12 sufficiently? Shall we move on to the HVAC question on page 13? Yes, let's do, Brian. Okay, so I think uh, this is uh, it, an area that uh, one of the uh, things that I, is my understanding that when you have fresh air coming into your building, uh, the uh, you do limit the exposure to uh, COVID-19 and other airborne dis uh, uh, diseases. And so what we did, uh, we start working uh, with our mechanical engineer to provide to go into every school uh, and basically conduct an analysis of of our uh, HVAC and air and indoor air quality and, and uh, our possibilities of, of uh, you know, what can we do to make sure that when children come to school um, they're they're as safe as possible with the CO2 levels uh, with the amount of fresh air coming in and one of the uh, ventilation areas that we need to look at is uh, cubic feet per minute, right? So the uh, so, so how much uh, ventilation is, accu is actually being pumped into a room at a certain given time. Uh, I learned a whole crash course on uh, air ventilation uh, this uh, last week and this week with regards to this. And it really depends on the uh, year, but apparently from what I was told, the, the air, Back in the 1970s, uh, there were regulations around uh, seven, uh, uh, five, five cubic feet per mi minute uh, per person uh, of outside air and exhaust air in a room. And then in a, throughout the 1970s and 1980s, it's kind of gone up and down. Um, so the 15, uh, basically the uh, government has, I think, I think we're right now around 15 cubic feet per minute. And so uh, in order to make sure that we have fresh air for our children, who are going to, you know, we're expecting to wear masks, and we want to pump in pump in fresh air into the built into the rooms. Uh, we we worked working with the mechanical engineer. We thought that doubling that to a 30 cubic feet per minute uh, per person of outside exhaust air would be uh, would be very helpful, uh, especially during a pandemic where we're asking folks to come back to school, and this uh, could really help. And I think uh, so. What we did is we had the mechanical engineer meet with, uh, go to each school. We provided a uh, detailed report to each principal about what some of the short-term goals of improving the air quality in the school, which would be, I would think that the short-term goals is what we want to get done before we open school. Uh, we learned uh, little things like we had to replace some uh, filters at the school, at some of the schools. Uh, we did have to order a part uh, for one of our elementary schools, uh, which uh, again, I, I was very concerned about. I was told that we had to get it. We had to make the order today uh, in order to get it within the next five to six weeks. Uh, and so uh, we are, uh, we, we ordered that, to, we put the order in today. Um, and I was told that we should be okay to get it set up. I did also, we also met with the architect, uh, our, our Black River uh, designed to uh, also go out to the schools and meet with each principal about setting, making sure that their isolation rooms have the proper ventilation for their um, 
for the rooms uh, to make sure that you know, if you have children in there, the air, first of all, isn't just coming in there, but you, if a child's in there, it's not just going out. Uh, and so the idea is uh, if you can make sure that you have 30 cubic feet per minute per person in an isolation room and they're still and they're wearing a mask, uh, you're really limiting uh, exposure to even if you have someone else in that room uh, with them. So, that, so we're trying to make sure we do that information as um, as um, uh, we're trying to make this a reality for all of our schools before the, before the start of the school year. Now, I know one of the things is how do we pay for this, right? So uh, it is my understanding efficiency Vermont is an option. And I did have a, a good conversation with uh, uh, one of the folks at efficiency Vermont. Uh, and they uh, have asked me uh, and my team to submit a grant to help pay for some, to offset some of this cost. I don't know what we'll get. There's no guarantee we'll get anything, but uh, we are work. We are going to be able to submit something uh, hopefully soon uh, for this uh, project. Thanks, Brian. Um, I should just mention that Brian's anecdote about having to order today a part in order to receive it with uh, five to six weeks out is uh, a lead up to um, some of the things we'll be having to deal with in the second block, the, uh, the finance committee block of our agenda. Um, are there board member questions for Brian on this, um, the subject of, uh, of air quality? No, not so much air quality, I guess. Um, going back to the opening, just about masks and whether we, the school district will be providing masks for students. Um, just, I know there'll be a cost associated and kids will probably lose masks on a regular basis and like helping parents cover that cost if they can't afford it. Um, and then also ordering things. I know trying to order um, thermometers, the pointing thermometers took like, um, a friend who had to order some for his work and took like four weeks to get them. So I don't know if we're considering doing that too. Yes, yes. I, I, is uh, Lori still there? I know Lori's been, uh, we have a task force that's been working to put together a lot of uh, supplies and all the things that you mentioned, I know we're purchasing uh, or we're intending on purchasing. And Lori, can you comment more on that? I was just gonna say, I think we're gonna cover it in great detail under item 423. Thanks, Lori. So I'm jumping a ahead. We have a packet of all the things that we're buying, and we're actually the orders are going out this week. So, it's it's on it's on page um, 19. If you're interested to see the list. Thank you, Jaya. You're moving us forward. <laughs> so, um, I, I I take it then that we should go to 4.2 Finance Committee, and um, Flora, do you want to kick it off? It, sure. So the finance committee met at, at five, and the, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let uh, Lori do. She she did a review of I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but did a review of what we would be filing for the CARES Act, and I, I let her speak to to that, and then we'll touch on the other points. Uh, Lori. So um, the list um, I put together with the financial report and it's on, if in the board packet, it's on page 14. And what you can see is um, what we basically spent uh, from March until June. Um, in summary, uh, we spent 112,000 on instructional and related support costs. Um, for our daycare program that was run by Community Connections, we had revenues of 46,000 expenses of 98. So we would be submitting a CARES reimbursement for $51,855. And we also ran the food program delivering meals to families at their homes. Um, that generated a, a, lar a large amount of income, 201,000, uh, but our expenses were 455. So the net amount that we're requesting from CARES is 254,000. Um, so if you add up the net amount on all those, the total that we will submit on our application is about 418,000. Um, additionally, we closed the books on July 3rd. Um, as I noted in the memo, we still hadn't had guidance from the Agency of Education. So 
in, in order to close, I decided to call our audit firm, RHR Smith, and they gave me guidance on recording this as a receivable. Um, should we not collect the full amount, um, then we would be booking it in FY21 for the difference. Um, if we collect the full amount, there'll be no other entry needed. Um, I'm waiting for application materials. Um, I've been working with the agency of ed today on that, and I believe we'll have those documents in the next couple of weeks, hopefully to get the money by the end of August is my hope. Um, did you want me to touch on anything else for? Um, it's still projected that we'd end the year about 1.8 million above our 2% target, um, but we would wanna um, consider the fact that if for some reason they find some of our costs ineligible, we might need to reserve some of that fund balance to pay the difference. Okay. You, yeah. Yep. Those, those were the main, the, the main points. And, and we'll have a future meeting if you read your package, uh, but will we consider options for this, uh, for this balance? But we won't do that tonight. Great. So, um, thank you very much. 4.2.2, uh, we have an item to authorize the Finance Committee to award bids over 15000 and uh, up to 100000 for COVID-19 items, so as to um, not have to convene the, the board and plenary session every time we, um, we exceed that $15,000 limit. Um, uh, there should be a language for a motion on page 19, I believe. Should I? Uh, um, we did have a finance meeting uh, around this, but I let the motion carry first. And if somebody wants to make the motion, Jonas. I'll make the motion. Okay, I'll Kari make will make the motion. motion. Jonas seconds. Is that okay, Jonas? Thank you. Um, very good. So the um, the motion is uh, Lisa. Did you get it? Sorry, I can't find it. I'm looking at page nineteen. Lisa, um, Lisa, I think it's authorized it's, the finance um, committee. Those points one, two, three under three point two. Yes, it's the first bullet. Um, so authorize the finance committee to award COVID-19 related bids over 15,000 per Vermont Title 16, Section 559, up to 100,000 per item. And uh, Kari moved it and Jonas um, seconded. And we had a discussion as a, as a finance committee and we felt like it, they had asked us for a ceiling before one of the board members. So we felt that 100,000 looks like a good number. We also had a discussion that it felt like, you know, we, we want to have, have as much flexibility as possible so that we can order it as needed without putting too much requirements on the superintendent and the central office. So it was thumbs up from everybody in the finance committee that helps the discussion. Sorry, um, that's great. Thank you, Flora. Lindy, did you have something? Yeah, I did have something because I heard parts of it. I sat in during the finance committee, but I'm just thinking I would like an example of something in the $100,000 range that has to be ordered today so that I have a better understanding um, because people are acting like that's not a lot of money. But for me, that's a couple of cars. So. Mm -hmm. What we didn't talk about was that there's a temperature uh, piece of equipment that might cost um, for four different buildings an accumulated total of about 81,000. Um, we're not sure yet. We would have to complete the entire bid process. Um, so we had asked if this was, um, if this was authorized tonight, could the finance committee meet by the end of July? Excuse me. <coughs> end of August, you said the 20, end oh, no, yeah, the 29th, July 20. And that would buy <laughs> enough machines for four buildings, you said? Or is that for one building? That was our current estimate. We need to officially bid. Okay. 
Thanks, Lindy. Um, uh, other questions, Stephen? I, I appreciate the time we find ourselves in, and I, uh, my inclination is to support this. Um, but everyone knows my fiscal conservatism. So, I, I mean, I will be supporting it, but I want the finance committee to feel the weight of my wrath and eyes over their shoulder as they're making decisions that um, I fully expect, even though I've given permission, that they're still going to be held publicly accountable for their decisions. So I'm just strongly encouraging very wise choices. I, I, I don't have any reason not to trust, and that's why I'm going to approve it. But I, I just feel I want to um, make that statement. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Lisa, I hope you took note of that. Um, Jonas. Um, I appreciate what, what, uh, what Stephen just said, but my guidance would be uh, not to be penny wise and pound foolish. Let's get kids back to school. Let's do it safely. Let's spend the money that we need to. Good. I hope you got that too, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and just that clarification, Scott, that this is all COVID-19. It's not like you're giving us a checkbook for going and spending and in, in everything. This is all related to COVID-19. Thank you, Flora. Um, an important point. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we move to a vote? I guess my only concern is that if cases rise and we can't open schools and we spend all this money um, on the supplies, I don't know, will they could be used some way in the future? Or um, is there any way to get reimbursement on any of this or anything? Uh, I see Jonas has his hand up. Yeah. I would say, Jael, if we can't open schools, then absolutely there will be use for all the PPE. And at some point, hopefully, we'll be able to reopen schools and all that work will, will be necessary. We are living in, in the, we're not in a post pandemic era. The pandemic is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. We will need this stuff. Thanks. Uh, Stephen, and then Roy. And I would, this is probably not very reassuring to hear. As a board member, we'll find ourselves having to make decisions in real time based on the best information we have. So for me, in real time, based on the best information we have, the intent is to reopen and we'll need things to reopen. If two months from now, that's a fiscal unwise choice that we made, so be it. But we, we're required to act and we have to act now and we have to act with the best information we have in good faith. So um, could there be um, unnecessary expenditures down the road? I think the answer has to be fairly yes, but I think that doesn't we still have to make a decision now. So I've always felt like I need to be guided by the best information I have in front of me at the moment. And if I need to meet the decision, I need to make the decision. That's my responsibility. So right. I, I, you know, that I just offer that um, insight that um, I have complete trust you're operating the best you can with what you've got. And if down the road, we spent more money than we needed to. It's unfortunate. Understood. Thank you very much, Stephen. First, Lori, and then Joe. Uh, uh, when she asked, is there reimbursement? Yes, there is reimbursement. There's CARES reimbursement for expenses for FY20 and FY21. Um, it's unclear whether there'll be sufficient money to cover every cost throughout the state of Vermont to reopen schools. So should there not be sufficient money? I was told today the formula would be similar to our special ed reimbursement. Um, everyone would get the same percentage. So at the end of the day, I mean, if it was 75% of their costs, that's how it would work out as long as the total sum of money at the state was expended. Is that too confusing or? Um, okay. No, it's good. Um, Jill? Um, just on the, on the subject of, you know, are we spending money on something we might not need? 
um, the, the guidance that I gave to my um, home health and hospice members in my work at the beginning of this crisis when they were debating some expensive N95 masks and some other things that were, you know, just hard decisions is, and I, and this has worked really well, is which, which thing do you want to regret, right? You have to make an imperfect decision. Which thing do you want to regret? I would rather regret that we bought too much than that we didn't do everything we needed to do. So we don't have it. We are not going to have perfect information, but I, I have found that to be a really helpful guiding way to think about this stuff through this whole crisis. Thank you. Um, are we ready for a vote? Yeah? Okay. Um, all in favor of Kari's motion, seconded by Jonas, to authorize the Finance Committee to award bids over 15,000 uh, up to 100,000 for COVID-19 items, please click yes or thumbs up or whatever. Um, if you're opposed, click no or thumbs down. Um, and I'm seeing all uh, yeses, I believe. Yes, very good. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, we'll move on to school 4.2.3, school reopening COVID-19 expense, page 19 um, as well. I, I'm losing track. Floor, do you want to introduce this one? Yes, so we, we also review uh, this one in our finance uh, in our finance meeting and basically it's those items, I'm just looking for my notes, sorry, those items that uh, need to be uh, bought immediately. We have, we already authorized uh, $200,000 of that uh, previously, so we're looking at adding $300,000 to, to that, right, Lori? So that's what we would need for tonight, a motion to authorize. It, it, this are, these are things that have already been uh, vetted by the state that we would be purchasing. Sorry. So um, as Fuller said, we need a motion to, um, uh, to authorize the uh, the administration to spend 300,000 for uh, COVID-19 expenses connected to school reopening without additional board action. I think this is very much in the same line. Stephen, look. Didn't we just do that? No. Uh, we just gave them permission to spend up to $100,000 on items. You, you gave uh, the finance committee permission to approve um, uh, I guess bid items up to um, up to a hundred thousand okay. dollars. We're authorizing here new uh, more money, um, not pre as I understand it, Floor. Yeah, we it's just we need this today, Stephen, in order to get them on time. So there's no time for the finance committee to meet again, and we're in a meeting. So these are items that we would like to have them uh, that. Lori and the central office team and leadership team need to have access to that uh, now for timing issues. And then you are authorizing us from now on to be able to meet more frequently to do take that type of decision. Okay, understood. Uh, it's not enough for me to hear, we need $300,000 to buy some things. What things? At least give me some rough guidelines. Yeah, yeah, but there's a- To me, that's, a that's way too vague to-, to there's a list. To respond, as I have a list. Yeah, there's a list. So, for example, we need to purchase desks for our schools so that the classrooms can meet the requirements. So, there's a number of schools that need desks. Um, there are things like PPE equipment for nurses, um, PPE equipment for faculty, staff, and students. There's food service and custodial PPE. Um, it includes those items listed here. And so there are a lot of different purchases. Some are three thousand um, dollars, but the sum of them in total projected could be as high as three hundred thousand. It's yeah. software. I mean, I'm trying to think of what uh, did I cover enough examples? Or um, there's a number of software applications for health screening application. They're um, listed on page 19 in our I, page. Yeah, page 10 in the financial. 
-hmm. So there's $22,000 just for the software, for the health screening software. So all of those uh, that we were talking about before will be part of this package. Um, thank, thank you, that's, that's adequate for me. I, I yeah. just, you know, don't say I want $300,000 for some COVID. Yeah, thing. sorry, I, I, was, I was operating on that assumption that everybody had read the package, but I should have been more clear, sorry. Uh, so, so yeah, on page 10 of the, of the finance committee and on page 19, you can see supplies, equipment, software, staffing. It, there's a list there. So if I'm not mistaken, we still need a motion. I, I can make the motion, or there's some the chair that finance me, but I'll make the motion to approve. Um, to I'll approve. Second. Up to $300,000. I'm sorry, Great. I'm in the front page right now. Yeah. Great. Floor moves. Chris seconds. You got that, Lisa? Great. Okay. Um, further discussion? Or I, I think it, it's very much along the lines of the last, um, the last item um, that we voted on. Um, my, with the voice of my, the vo my, my conscience speaks in the voice of Stephen Look. So, um, uh, but Lindy, I, I saw your hand. Um, something that has kind of upset me about the state of Vermont when I was saying earlier about needing more guidance one of the lowest spending states on students, and we're one of the highest, and that would be Alabama, which is have, I mean, we can't say a lot that's great about that, and it is where my family's from, but they have bought three masks for every teacher and three masks for every student to be distributed to the schools from the Department of Ed. Um, and I, it's another thing that I am feeling like the state is letting down our locals and leaving things too much to school districts where there's going to be inequities of districts who don't have the means to be buying the masks for their teachers or their students. And I, I'm just still, I want that said in a public meeting that I feel that the Agency of Education isn't um, doing the best that I think they could be doing in this situation for our kids and our teachers. Thank you, Lindy. Um, I, no taken. Um, any other any other discussion, or shall we move to a vote? Uh, all in favor then of uh, Flores motion, seconded by Chris, to um, authorize the spending of up to three hundred thousand on uh, COVID nineteen related equipment and supplies as listed uh, in the memo. Um, please click on the yes button. If you're opposed, click on the no button. And once again, I'm seeing all the yeses. Great, okay. So that motion carries as well. And I, I noticed that, um, uh, again, we've kind of the clock has turned, we're at 808. Um, should we again just take a, a stretch break? Five minutes? You're all right with that? Um, so, John, yeah, do have, Chris. Do we, have much, do we have much more in the finance? Because why don't we just, yeah. if we don't have more, let's just finish it out and then we'll start afresh with a different section, would be my uh, suggestion. That different section just happens to be yours, eh? Um, I have to. I have to bone up on it somehow, Scott. <laughs> um, there, the only thing is there, there are maybe five more items um, under finance that, uh, that are not necessarily um, you know, open and shut. Yeah. So I, I guess if you okay. just wanted a report, and, but we wouldn't have enough time for discussion. I don't, I don't know. How, I'm happy either way. We're, yeah. And there are a couple of votes that we have to take too. So let's let's just take the break then. I'm sorry. No, 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 no problem. Good. It was a good question. Okay, so let's break. Um, reconvene at eight eight fifteen. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I hope my clock reads eight fifteen.
Great. Lisa, are you um are you there? Excellent. Got it. In that case, we can we can continue. So we're now I, I hope you all had a refreshing um pause. Uh we're now on 4.2.4, .4, which is central office renovations. Um, I don't know, Flora, would you like to introduce this as well? Sure, Scott, thank you. So uh, we talked about renovations at central office that are uh, necessary to get people back to the, uh, to the building. And there we're looking for uh, 26, uh, thousand dollars of uh, up to 26,000 on renovations for central office and that's partitions in the front and temporary partitions in the back or potentially fixed partitions in the back and that would make that decision with the with Black River Design and, and Bill Ford. It, we had a long conversation about mm -hmm. equity around our buildings and make sure that we are we are taking the same approach in all our buildings, and this would allow the staff to to get back and in in person at central office. the The money is in the budget for on under capital, so we uh, uh, we did not have all thumbs up uh, on on this one. But we also feel that we don't want to hamstring the central office to operating properly and supporting the rest of our of our schools since the money is in the budget. Uh, that was the end of our discussion. So open it up for a motion so that we can discuss. Yes, um, Kari. I'll make the motion. I would move that we authorize the uh, spending of up to $26,000 for health and safety measures COVID related with prompt um, consideration given to our other buildings. Got that, Lisa? Do we have a second? Jonas seconds. Very good. Uh, further discussion? If we don't have further... Yeah, I, oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, yeah I, like I can hear you there. Um, I appreciate Kari's um, comment about prompt consideration of other... Um, I would like to make it a little stronger and say direct um, whoever is doing that analysis to go and to visit each of the other schools and do a similar analysis to determine whether or not those schools need a similar type of retrofitting uh, for the safety of those staff members. So rather than consider actually have, um, I think with Black River Design, have them go out and do the work uh, to see what needs to be done. Um, can, uh, can I uh, just uh, try go to go ahead? Yes, Brian. So uh, one of the uh, things is uh, you, you, you do this work here with the renovations. And uh, a, a few weeks ago, we uh, uh, I also met with uh, one of our principals. Um, I think Gillian is here right now. So I see her. I know uh, we worked with uh, Bill Ford and a contractor to go out to the other schools also to see what else needs to be done in regards to this area. I have not had a chance to talk to Gillian. I believe she was doing this important work today uh, to go out there and I should have some more information uh, at a, a future board meeting in regards to what else is needed in those in these high traffic areas in the schools uh, in order to uh, make sure uh, that staff and students are safe. So Gillian, Gillian does have her hand up. Maybe Gillian can- uh, uh, Oh, Gillian, I, there you are. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, so just really quickly, Bill Ford and I traveled around. Um, we did not go to Rumney and Doty. In part, we didn't go to Doty because um, as part of our uh, current work, there was, some, there was some stuff in there about hours for the front office. So Black River has already done some reconfiguring. But today what we did is we went through and we focused on all the front office areas in all of the school buildings. And so we're moving forward. Bill is Bill Ford is going to go around with Portland Glass, and he's got a detailed list of everything, and they're going to prepare estimates. So the schools are being taken care of. 
And I just want to say that the, it's, I, I appreciate Gillian uh, uh, and Bill Ford working on this uh, and going out to each school. I know that the, um, uh, one of the challenge, of course, was just getting uh, folks from, you know, who have that expertise to come in because apparently uh, Gillian, when we meet, we met about two, two, two plus weeks, two weeks ago uh, with Bill to try to talk about how we're going to uh, do this. And today was the first day of availability. So, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult even getting the folks to come because I guess there's a, a lot of uh, demand right now from other folks around the uh, state of Vermont. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, if, we, if we stick with sort of the, the clean motion that, uh, that Kari made and incorporate your observations and, and, um, and guidance, Chris, uh, in the in the minutes, um, Lisa, did you catch what what Chris was saying about um, making sure that the that the schools are given the um, similar uh, the same consideration as the central office? Okay, sorry, I didn't get. I, I just said that um, under the discussion that Chris suggested more direct language in the motion around the other buildings. And then that Gillian shared that she and Bill Ford have visited the schools and are actually preparing specific information. Yeah, that sounds like it'll work. Yeah. It does. It um, absolutely does. Great. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Lisa and Gillian and just everybody. Okay, um, anybody else want to uh, contribute to the discussion or shall we move to a vote? We'll move to a vote then. All in favor of Kari's motion as seconded by Jonas, please click yes. Opposed, click no. Or thumbs up, thumbs down um, as you so, wish. Scott, I, lo I lost the connection, so I'm just gonna say aye. Okay, very good. Um, that works, Chris. Thank you. And uh, again, I see all yeses, so that motion carries as well. Um, great. Okay. So um, let's see. Uh, well, um, I very stealthily smuggled 4.2.5 into 4.1.1. So we can skip over to 4.2.6, solar net metering. Um, Floor, would you like to introduce? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. Um, uh, first Floor, then Dorothy. Sure. So we discussed this uh, at length in our uh, finance committee meeting. Uh, we, the Novus Energy was looking for a 20-year contract. Uh, we, uh, we were proposing a two-year. It basically, because we, uh, from the very beginning, we've been looking at having an energy consultant. If you guys remember this, we've been wanting to come up with a job description and have a, a broader approach to all our schools and what is our ultimate goal with all of this. So uh, they are not interested in a two-year uh, in a two-year contract, just a twenty-year uh, contract. So that's where that's what there is right now the recommendation from the from the finance committee will be to to uh, still concentrate our resources in finding uh and, and putting a future agenda item getting the energy consultant and having a more comprehensive approach about our energy use around all of our buildings thanks for dorothy um i i was going to table Make a motion to table that article. Um, would you like to table it, um, or uh, because a motion to table is not debatable? Um, so just table it without. I, I let's just we've got a lot to talk about, and we spent a lot of time, and I think just be, table it and be done with it. Okay, um, Dorothy has moved to table it. Um, there is no discussion on a table motion. So um, is there a second to Dorothy's motion? Um, I'm not hearing a second. That's fine. 
Okay. Um, sorry, Dorothy. Um, okay. Um, so anyway, what, uh, Kari? Uh, I would make a motion that we decline the offer from Novus and um, proceed with our plan to um, hire an energy consultant and develop a comprehensive energy plan for the district. I'll second that. I'd second that. <laughs> okay. Um, it sounds like there there's competition over seconding. Um, I heard Chris first, I JL. JL. <laughs> I, I defer to JL. Okay. Well, um, in that case, Lisa, Kari moved, Jael seconded. Um, uh, further discussion? If not, let's move to a vote. All in favor of Kari's motion to decline this um, opportunity and move ahead with, uh, uh, sorry, that's not what Kari moved. Lisa, do you mind rereading it again? So I don't mess it up. Um, to decline the offer from Novus and to proceed with the plan to hire an energy consultant and develop a comprehensive energy plan for the district. Excellent. All in favor of that, please click yes. If you're opposed, please click no. And once again, I'm seeing all yeses. And, and Chris, I assume you're an I. I am, I, I think I, did you see my click? It clicks yes. Ah, oh, yeah, I do see it now. Thank you, great. Thank you. Okay, so the motion carries. Brian. Yeah, just, just a point of clarification. Uh, if uh, Is there a timeline that the uh, board would like to uh, set for, for me to uh, begin trying to get this energy consultant in? Uh, do, is there, is it? I'm just trying to get an idea. I, I think we should put it in a, a, in a future uh, board agenda item and then first find out a uh, consult with Bill for we were waiting for Bill to also have some some time and see what are the qualifications that we're looking to have from this person we uh, and uh, in, and what what is our ultimate goal with hiring an energy consultant and I, I wouldn't want to add more into your plate uh, this point right now so it might be something once we get school started it, that we can so no or as at least from the sense that i got for finance committee it's something we want to do but it's not you don't need to jump on this tomorrow okay so, okay. so maybe after after uh if all goes well with reopening sometime after that after that time period yeah okay great thank you flora it, 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 nobody objects to what flora just said i trust Good. So let's move on then to 4.2.7, Berlin driveway reconstruction and paving project. Um, page 21. Um, would you like to introduce it, Flora? Sure. So uh, they opened bids at Berlin. They opened bids yesterday. Uh, the finance committee had a chance to review this before our meeting. And we're basically doing uh, looking for two motions to uh, award the bid to Avery Excavation. And also the bad news is that we came over budget. You guys got this email a little bit late uh, today. So we're between uh, the 10% 10, the 10 contingency and the additional funding needed, we're looking at $126,000 um, extra to move. The money is in the capital budget. Uh, so what is this renovation is basically lighting, parking, uh, uh, parking for Berlin, so handicap accessibility in that uh, in that area. And Aaron, I believe, is in the call, so he can also speak to it. Uh, I personally see it as an investment. We we had a lively uh, discussion as a board, as uh, as as a group, but it's something that was before in the bond that the the previous school board uh, moved out of the bond to make it more palatable for the community. And then it's something that was earmarked by the previous Berlin school board that what we're looking to add is just add 120. I know that it's not just, but at 126 right now, we had earmarked 399 for that uh, before. So uh, that's, that's basically 
basically it. So we basically, we don't do it right now. We're just kicking the can down the road and the money is in there for capital. And I, everybody else from the finance committee can chime in too. Thanks, Laura. Um, should we have, uh, is it necessary? Do you find it necessary to say anything, Aaron, or just to add to what Flora was saying? In the finance meeting, I just mentioned that um, it's a project that we've been hoping for for a long time now, and it was great that we were able to, you know, move it forward to this point. Um, only been there two years, but I know that uh, in just that short amount of time, been able to see how um, difficult it is having the parking lot um, being just just dirt and gravel. Um, it has become a safety concern around um, handicap uh, handicap accessibility being one, but safety being another. Um, not just mud season, but even during the winter season, it can be glare ice, uh, and we've had to um, just be very diligent in in trying to make sure that it's safe in that sense. Uh, we've also uh, in terms of the lighting, I mentioned also that we have a lot of building use, being one of the facilities in Berlin that folks can use and public can use and the community can use uh, almost every night of the week, it's it's in use. Um, <clears throat> so during the winter months with, with basketball and volleyball and um, other kinds of events, uh, the parking lot being as dark as it is during the winter, it's good that we are, you know, hoping that we can increased lighting in the parking lot as well. Um, and also just the maintenance of the potholes that are constantly happening uh, have been challenging as well, so. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, now I'm, uh, sorry, Lisa, we, we don't yet have a motion, do we? Oh, I, I don't, I'm gonna need some help on that. <laughs> okay. So um, <clears throat> basically what we need is a motion to approve the bid, um, correct? Yeah, we need, we need two motions. Uh, first, to award the, the Berlin project bid to Avery Excavation Inc. in the amount of $477,518. Sorry, can you tell me the amount again? Four hundred and seventy-seven, five hundred and eighteen dollars. Thanks. That's um, that's the first motion, and that's then the first, that's I'll, the first motion. So let's. I'll second that just to get that um, okay. off the table. Okay. So floor moves, and um, Chris seconds. All right. Very good. So discussion. All right. We're, we've basically had the discussion, Stephen. It's it's just a clarifying question. Um, so the budget was three ninety nine two fifty, but that did or did not include a ten percent contingency. So uh, I, I'm I'm going to let Laurie speak to this, but it did not include the ten percent contingency, and it did not include the the lighting was an addition. Uh, no, that's okay. That Lori doesn't need to speak to it. That's all I needed to understand. Thank you. Other questions? Jonas. My bad. Uh, uh, I'm going to channel uh, Rick here and, and ask if there's a way that we can protect the, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars investment we're about to make in, in the in the Berlin driveway. Um, you know, is there a plan for, you know, upkeep and, um, you know, uh, repair when necessary to extend the life of this thing? That's just a little bit of a sticker shock. I, I would hope so, Jonas, and that's part of what we've been, uh, you know, that's sort of what the mentality that we've been using for the facilities uh, committee. We do not have, we have a facilities committee, we don't have a facilities committee as a board uh, yet, but it is part of right now the task for the finance committee. So, so I would say that, you know, the Berlin it has a facility committee and would be, you know, responsible 
it, you know, our entire district. So it's not just Berlin. That is the mentality that we are having and the promise that we're making to the public. Lindy. Corinne posted a question in the chat about a retention pond, which I'm assuming all of this is in the bid to be legal next to a wetlands and everything. Can somebody address that? And on another note, as somebody who worked in the district and was at Berlin a lot, that parking lot can be a nightmare as far as the mud. And also because of the way it is, getting people to park in a way that everyone can fit because there aren't any lines and the first person who parks kind of sets the tone. So um, as somebody who's been there through a lot of the weather, it is certainly necessary and it's a nice flat lot as far as getting it paved. But I would like the part about the environmental concern. But Aaron. So there is a um, separate project um, and then I, I can't think of the name of the folks, but uh, um, that we're getting one of the stormwater um, runoff systems in place. Somebody can chime in with the name of the folks. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I guess I wasn't loud enough the last time. Um, uh, for the stormwater treatment uh, project. So we have that that's supposed to be happening as well, but that's been a separate project. I know Deborah oversaw most of that while she was here. Um, but that is part of the plan for that as well. And I think from what my understanding that satisfies that that issue. And that yes. also might help with Jonas's point of maintenance. I think that will help with, you know, how water affects uh, black, blacktop. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Steven. Uh, just one more thing. I was going to save it to the second motion, but I'll just say it now. And I, I think it's um, just restating what Floor said. But in my mind now, we've committed to paving the parking lots in all our schools. Maybe it's not going to happen in one or two years, but um, a plan to do it. Because the safety concerns of one gravel parking lot are the same safety concerns in other gravel parking lots. Thank you, Stephen. Jonas, I, I, I certainly don't. I hope we don't have to do that. Um, it, I think it's fair to say that the Berlin lot is, you know, a, a different animal than the Romney or the Doty lots, which are which are, which are both dirt. And I think Callus too, um, you know. And yeah, East Montpelier, East Montpelier too. If there's a specific, I mean, if there's a specific ADA issue with with Berlin, absolutely, you know, we should we should do that. Yeah. Um, but I don't I don't see that for Doty at least. Yeah. I think it's one of our largest schools too. Is one thing to remember, and most of the food drives have been taking place at Berlin too. So it is really an investment in an entire community, a large. Good. Um, is there more discussion of this motion, or shall we move to a vote then? You know, let me just and Chris, I'm yes, and Jonas said one size need not fit all, but we just case by case is what we should be doing in in our review. Thank you. And, okay, and, and Jonas again. I would just also note uh, in response to Corinne's question in the chat, where will the retention pond be? I imagine that the plans, you know, uh, now that they have, are about to be approved, will be public and you can review them, you know, like any other public document. Uh, Aaron, are, are, do you have anything further on that? Uh, specifically about where it will be? Yeah. Um, the design, uh, calls for it to if you're if you're familiar with these designs there's more of a, a place where the water flows to where it's filtered and there'll be a spot if you know berlin we have this uh, kind of apple orchard out front it's going to be off to that side of the property um, which is much better than the original design which was right in the center of the circle where the flagpole is and we said no <laughs> so everything will be you know kind of flowing uh on that's you know it's not visible, um, but that that basin area um, will be kind of towards the left as you're looking at the building, and you know we do it up with uh, foliage and 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 um, uh, 
gardening kinds of stuff like that. Um, we also, the design also called for um, a more underground design than some of the well ones that come way up above the surface. It's more of a manhole kind of design. So it won't be as sightly as other of these designs tend, tend to be. Great. We're very careful knowing that some of these designs are an eyesore and we fought to go around that pretty, pretty strongly. Thank you. Good. So then ready for a vote. If, um, if you're in favor of approving the motion, um, and, and I, Lisa, do you want to reread the motion just because my memory is starting to fail me? Um, yeah, it was just to award the bid to Avery Excavation in the amount of 477518. Very good, thank you. So all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no or thumbs down or whatever. And once again, I'm seeing all, all yeses. Okay, so the motion carries, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Now, um, approve. Like, do you we have, have a second, yeah, we have a second yeah. motion on so this. So approve the transfer of 126,000 with 126 and 20 dollars from the district capital fund as the project cost that's it okay um floor moves 126,000 and 126,020 dollars 126,020 dollars floor moves jonas did i see you second jonas seconds um further discussion Everybody understands what this is all about? Okay, very good. Shall we move to a vote then? All in favor, please click yes. If you're opposed, click no. And once again, I'm seeing all yeses. Great, thank you so much. Um, now, uh, we're done with finance and can move on to policy. Uh, before, before I hand it over to you, Chris, shall we, um, shall we get a, a motion to approve policy C-47 on um, uh, second reading? Yes, and, uh, yeah. yes please. Okay, well, you're moving it? No, no, no. I'm saying a motion would be a great idea. Okay, great. Uh, I'll, I'll make the motion. Dorothy moves to approve C-47 student exchanges on second reading. Um, do we have a second? Lindy seconds. Great. Okay. Chris, take her away. Okay, so we have um, one motion for approval, uh, C-47, which is a student exchanges policy. Uh, I'm sorry one policy for um, approval. Um, any questions on uh, the student exchanges policy? That will become a, an adopted policy if we vote in favor of it tonight. Hearing none? Tonight you want Hearing to call none. The I, sure. Um, I'm going to call the vote. I, I, I have to explain first, though that I am not going to vote because this policy affects me directly and immediately since we're expecting a, um, you know, inshallah, um, expecting a, a German exchange student um, this for this coming school year. So um, I will not vote even though um, I, I think it's a great policy. So all in favor, please say yes or click yes rather. If you're opposed, click no. And once again, I'm seeing all yeses. Great. Okay, so guys, did um, you make the salad? Could you guys hear me or no? Huh? Got a hot mic floor. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, wonderful. Uh, so 
Moving on to 4.3.2, Chris. So we have a, a series of other policies that are up for consideration. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just go through each one, one by one, uh, and ask, ask if there are any comments um, and, and concerns about any of them. So first up would be C20, which is a student conduct and discipline. Any, so hearing no questions or concerns, the policy committee would take it up next and just probably send it back at our next board meeting for adoption. Um, the next is C46, interrogation or searches of students by law enforcement or other non-school personnel. Um, and <laughs> this is a policy that generated a lot of discussion because section two um, previously um, allowed for um, the school making a student available for uh, interrogation or interview by law enforcement. And our discussion centered largely over whether students should be advised that they have the right uh, to record the conversation uh, and what that would look like. Uh, concerns were raised that if that happened, um, that there would be potentially FERPA um, concerns over what the student would say, whether it involved other students, whether the student with the recording could post it on social media and issues like that. So we sent it out to um, uh, council and council wrote back and basically said, school shouldn't make students available at all to law enforcement. So that's where, um, that's why we ended up including uh, or proposing language it, at number two now, striking out what had been and including what with language that you're looking at now. So if there's any questions about any of the, this, the aspects of C46, um, we, we'd be happy to entertain them. I see Stephen has a question, Chris. Chris, I like that, the, the move. I'm just, I'm wondering if, the, to me, the language is too specific. That's the new language that's been proposed. So the only, the old language said interrogation by no non-school personnel. Why would, why would we not use that same language instead of just restricting it to law enforcement? So in other words, blah, 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 would not make students available to non-school personnel for interview or interrogation. That's fine with me. I think later on it says law enforcement too. I, it, it just seems by saying law, law enforcement is making it too specific. And it, it, I'd like to see it more general and just say non-school personnel. I, I see Brian has some input. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Uh, as a, a former principal, uh, I was reading this and uh, in some school districts where I wish, wish where, where I have worked, uh, I wish I had seen something. I wish my the, the pre, some of my previous places I've worked had this policy uh, because uh, there is sometimes often a um, misnomer that police can just come into a school building without uh, permission of uh, to just go in. Obviously, there are times where they have to come in if there's a major, major imminent em emergency. But sometimes, uh, you know, they really need to be invited in by the by the school administration uh, and taking that away or uh, taking that off, taking it away from the uh, school administration. Uh, some, sometimes works against the school district and our mission from edu for educating children. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm definitely a, I am supportive of law enforcement. I just think that our, I also want to make sure that our our uh, school administrators, uh, you know, we operate under parentis locus. Uh, I hope I said that correctly. But we're the parents uh, in our schools when the parents are not there. Uh, and so, you know, we, I, I thought it was written well because we wanted to make sure it said law enforcement. Uh, I think that having, uh, I think uh, other personnel sometimes may come in. Uh, sometimes you have DCF or social workers, and agencies coming in and they may have been appointed by the court or the, and they come in to interview children based on uh, many different reasons, abuse, uh, alleged abuse, alleged neglect, other reasons they may come in. So, so I think uh, making sure that it was mentioning law enforcement uh, is intentional in that regards in doing that. 
You know, Brian, just to point out, we make an exception for that. In we have a step, num, paragraph number one covers what you're referencing right now, okay. and because that was raised, um, Jody raised that as a concern that there are times when um, um, social workers will come in and interview a student, and for that purpose, so we left that intact. Okay. okay. Jonathan. Yeah, Chris, do you anticipate that um, in Section 2 in the new language, uh, written notification, would that include email notification? Um, is your concern about actually it being received? Yeah, both. Either received, I'm only, I'm thinking in terms of, um, quickness of communication in other words if it's a if it's a letter and there may be a reason why there needs to be a quicker response by law enforcement or, or, or other non law enforcement personnel it seems to me that being able to do it electronically would would greatly facilitate both the request or from the school and vice versa the response from the parents or guardian to that situation as opposed to sending letters that Right. I mean, that could take days. Right. Well, but if the notification is the trigger, then however long it takes, that's how long it takes. Yeah. You know, because it's not, this, it doesn't really have an emergency component to it saying, uh, you know, I think the previous language said if we couldn't get in touch with the parent. Um, so this this trigger is you need the written notification. Okay, but that could include email, right? I mean, it's common oh, that absolutely. yeah, you know, writing is now considered in the legal community, right? Email email correspondence. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, others, uh, other questions or or uh, remarks on on C twenty. Or rather, C46, sorry. C46. Right. Um, looks like Jonas ha has his hand up. Yeah, I, I wonder if we could return to C20, given Kat's uh, comment in the chat, um, that uh, C20 only uses language appropriate for responses at U32, not at the elementary schools. Paragraph 4 refers to loft. Student services, the Spark Center, or community. Plus, it shares a restorative approach uh, that is practiced with a guiding adult. Those do not necessarily uh, exist in all our schools, which I think is a very salient point. Uh, <laughs> so what what if we approach it this way? What if we um, had two different versions? One for U32 and one for the elementary school. Um, you know, given that we're a single district um, and don't have policies directed for specific entities, maybe we should have deviation when it's warranted, like in this one. Yeah. Can I uh, just? Brian, go ahead. Yeah, I, I know, uh, and I know I'm looking at you know in school suspension, out of school suspension for less or ten days or more than ten days, and I know that we typically think of, you know, older kids. I'm really hoping we're not having so many uh, of our little kids or anyone really, but uh, especially at the elementary schools that we're going to have to expel. I'm, I'm just trying to, I know that uh, kids do things and make mistakes, but I also know that we're also trying a restorative approach where, uh, you know, we, we work with children and their families to, uh, who, who uh, make mistakes and they learn from their mistakes. And, uh, you know, I know this is really about the, uh, the discipline policy and so I, 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 I'm hoping we're not expelling too many of our youngsters anywhere, in particular in the elementary schools. And I would say that we're not. Okay. Sorry, I Judy. Say, I want to say that Aaron and I are part of that um, committee, and we did work on this, this policy extensively. I did specifically, which is probably why there's so much U32 language in it. However, I see planning room and I gave an example, but we can add some more examples in there because planning rooms happen across our schools. They're not just at U32. 
Um, and I would also say that a restorative approach doesn't necessarily mean that the person has been trained in restorative practices, but it's meant to encompass the trauma-informed work that we've all been doing. So there might need to be a little touch-up of language, but I think it is appropriate in what we're saying, the, the baseline of this policy across our district. Thanks. Um, I, I see Jonathan's uh, hand up icon. Um, Jonathan? I should unclick it because I raised it, but forgot to not raise it. <laughs> That's fine. Great. Um, okay. Uh, any other um, any other discussion of C forty six or C twenty? Cat. I didn't mean to get things all stirred up, um, but I do think it's really important for us to be thinking about when we're talking about um, policies that go that um, govern pre K to graduation that we're really thoughtful about our language. That it's clear that there are some um, things that are different in terms of the adult um, professional development in each of our buildings and in the, in the way that we respond, the way our buildings are set up to have resource rooms or planning rooms or spark centers. Um, these are all great approaches. I don't argue with any of them. I'm just saying we need to be clear when we're saying policy language that if it's specific, that it's clearly titled, it may include something like a restorative approach or so that we can touch on the idea that it's developmentally appropriate at each grade level um, and by built every building's particular flavor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yes. And Kat, with, um, along those lines, uh, primary responsibility here is, lay, is um, given to the principal. Of, right. of the school at the superintendent. Um, so that gives the principal a lot of authority in, in how this is approached, I believe. Uh, so, but we'll, we will take that into account in our, in our next revision. Perfect, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, Any other uh, questions? Um, no other, uh, none that I see, but um, are you able, uh, to read the chat box, Chris. This relates to the next one. Good. But um, I don't think there's anything more on C46, is there? So continue, please, Chris. OK, so we are up now on uh, C49, which is kindergarten entrance age. And this was another hotly debated policy change. So I'm going to. Throw it out to the board for any comments um, that they, anybody may have, or the public that they may have on this particular policy. Yes, there is a public comment in the chat box. Are, are, are you are you able to read it from Corinne? You know what I uh, I had it and then lo I I lost it actually. Um, Um, can can uh, someone paraphrase? Sure. It? Yeah. Um, she would like to see the September 1 to 30 consideration remain and just um, talk about it. So, the, so the, I'm going to let other board members chime in on this. How time? Sure. And explain the, you know, the, the so. Look to you, Aaron. Chris, were you asking me a question? Yeah, do you want to lay out the position of, for the change here, please? Sure. So this, the previous, uh, the former policy had this second paragraph here. Can you hear me okay? Everybody hear me okay? <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, and I raised the question um, in regards to that, that second piece because, and in speaking with my colleagues as well, um, the consensus feeling that, that that language opens up a lot of um, a lot of ambiguity, a lot of, of um, opportunity for inequity, uh, because we don't have a really solid system of determining if a student 
that falls within that month of September that they're just past the age really truly is, you know, quote unquote, ready for, for an early start to kindergarten. And we felt that just to be clear cut on a date um, is in a sense more fair than, than an ambiguous uh, timelines. I mean, Corinne brought up a great question and we talked about that same exact thing. You know, what about kids that are even further on? And even the other end of the spectrum, what about kids that might be, you know, ready uh, early and, um, or, or not ready. And so it did open up a, a lot of discussion and the consensus was that it felt that we, if, if, if we had a cutoff, it would be, it would just be easier. Um, and in a sense, more fair. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, Lindy has a point. This has just been one of those things that there is no, no way you can have a date that works for everybody because kids are kids and everybody's at a different place. But when you don't have a designated cutoff, then it becomes an emotional um, kind of, and in our own district, I don't know if this is a brand new policy or what, but when I worked there, I know of people who shopped around to see which school would accept kids that were born on September 5th or 6th and then looked at houses or rent in those areas because some of the elementaries were dead set. And even in the time I was working there, Callis had a different, I think they had a December date when all the other schools had a September date. And it just, you have to pick a date. And I think it's better to have a hard and fast date and then differentiate as a school has to do anyway. So. I, if we're going to have a policy, which it appears we do, it should be fair, like Aaron was saying, and it's, it's not up to an individual to shop around or for a principal to be put in the position of, yes, I know you're, you think your child is very ready, but that might not be true emotionally, but it might be true academic. You know, it just, I'm, I'm not in favor of keeping that paragraph. Thanks. Um, any any further discussion of of this policy of kindergarten entrance age before we uh, let Chris continue? I'm not seeing anything, Chris. So, so, so we'll move on. Thank you. Good. Um, so C49, no, no, same one. D3 um, is responsible computer, internet, and network use. Um, this did not generate, a, as I recall, much discussion or language change from what was already in existence. Any co comments or thoughts from uh, board members? Um, Okay. Very good. Chris, there, there is um, a public comment in the chat box regarding the previous policy that I overlooked. Um, Can you run policy? It, the, it says, um, I might suggest adding some language that at least mentions the ability to speak with the elementary school administration about it. About the entrance age? Yeah. So that, that kind of gets back to, um, it gets back to the, the difficulty of uh, potential inequity um, because some folks may be more assertive in speaking with the administration than others uh, and, you know, create a, a breach in the, 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 the dead, you know, the, basically the age line. Um, and I, I will say that I was on the other end of the debate. Um, because of um, a sense that different st students are ready at different points in time and that we should accommodate that for the student. Uh, but the, the committee went the other way. And um, so I, I think if we created an exception, you're undermining the goal of, of, uh, of uh, simplicity, really, in terms of this is the deadline and this is the rule. Great. 
Thanks. Um, please feel free just, to. Oh, oh, oh uh, Lindy is, has her hand up. I, I just yeah. think in a policy, there's not a need to say something like you can speak to the administrator unless the policy says there's a window. Um, any parent who's enrolling their child in a school has the right to talk to an administrator about whatever they want. Um, but I, I think that you wouldn't put that in a policy. Not That's unless it meant right. something. Right, yeah. So please continue, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, having heard no comments on D3, we'll move on to D4, which is Title I comparability. Again, not, not a, we didn't have, I don't think we have really any discussion on this. So it's just passing it along. Um, any comments on D4? That brings us up to D4, which, which yeah, is animal continue. dissection. Animal dissection is D5. Um, you know, some mm -hmm. of the comments to this were that, um, didn't even know if we did animal dissection any longer in the district. Um, so, but any comments on this policy? I'm not seeing any. Okay, up to D6, class size. And pretty straightforward. <coughs> straightforward. Yes, um, I'm not seeing any. Oh, Kari has his hand up. Um, this is a related but separate comment. Uh, occasionally we see in these policies um, the uh, requirement for a report from the superintendent. Like this one in number four says uh, at least annually on the implementation. And I have this uh, concern that we don't know about, we don't have a calendar for these reports. We don't, and we're not necessarily monitoring this. And I was wondering if it would be possible to generate a list or a calendar so we were more aware. Uh, you know, what Kyra would, will do is it will um, work to generate each policy that requires a reporting, that has a reporting mechanism, um, and bring it back to the board so we can figure out how we would like to um, arrange that for our for our schedule and 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 work with the administration as to when it would make most sense to have a reporting requirement in the year. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Great. Um, anything else on D6? If not, um, go ahead, Chris. Okay, go up to E1, which is uh, parent, Title I Parental Involvement. And not a not a lot of discussion on our end. Uh, hey Chris, what about D six? Did I skip one? Yeah. Uh, we um, I thought. Uh, did, we, did you have something to say about D six, child? Um, no, I just didn't hear him mention it. <laughs> oh, okay. That that's okay. the one Kari was talking about the report. Oh, sorry, I thought that was the Pat talking about the animal dissection. Uh, no, I, I think Harris was talking about D4, the Title I comparability, but also as a general statement. Anyway, doesn't matter. So we're up to any question on D6 class size? Okay, we're I, up to E1. I don't remember. Yeah. Sorry, Chris, I'm just wondering, is this gonna change with COVID and do we need to address anything with this? I don't remember our discussion on the policy committee. No, I don't, I don't think we did discuss that. We, we, just, we certainly discussed that about absences and in terms of the COVID and the impact on that and that we were gonna monitor that and see if it created a problem. I don't think we did, this, did that same discussion on D6. Anything else? No, uh, but we could, you know, we could add in a proviso um, saying that, that that is time limited to um, the uh, coronavirus and take it into account if necessary. Although if it's, if it's um, 
but we would have we would have to make sure that we're. I mean, we couldn't supersede or undermine the statute through the policy. Then you know we'll look at okay. that. Okay. Stephen has his hand up. I, I would just, from my read of the policy, it's just sufficiently vague enough that it it covers COVID. You know, to develop guidelines for minimal and optimal class sizes. So the minimal or optimal class size would realistically change under COVID. So this policy, in my mind, the language of it allows enough flexibility to make adjustments. And uh, I, I'll just give my two cents. Uh, I agree with Stephen on that. Okay. Thanks, both of you. Thank All you. Right, Chris. Great. Um, so on to um, E1, Title I, Parental Involvement Compact. Uh, again, I don't think we had much discussion about E1. And just pass it along to the board. Yeah, uh, I'm not seeing anybody with a hand up. Uh, next up is um, E45. Uh, role of religion in schools. Um, I Any, don't believe um, this is. Jonas, I believe, had, was that a stretch or a hand? A hand. Man. Uh, so just yeah, curious, Chris, uh, where did the language come from in terms of what to do, what not to do, um, tips for planning activities? I don't suppose you guys drafted that. We did not draft this. It's not a required policy. And I think it, it was a recommended policy um, from, and the language I think came from the uh, Vermont School Board Association is my recall. Uh, I don't know that specifically. Does anybody else on the committee remember where the language came from? No, but I remember us adding something about um students not being penalized for absences for religious holidays? I think we did do that in relation, um, and that's on the top of page two. You're absolutely right about that, because I think we did it to mirror uh, the change in the teacher's contract. Yeah, I just don't see, it's not a different colored font. It's, you're right, it's not, it is not highlighted, but I think it's on, um, it's under uh, what not to do at the very top, but bullet on the second page under considerations. You got, um, you I got that, Chris? Uh, would you say it was Lindy? I'm sorry. Under what not to do, it's yeah. the bullet that starts the next page. Impose rigid attendance policies. Right, okay. And so that's what not to do, to not impose rigid yeah. you know, attendance. I, I actually thought we changed it so it was more directive in saying um, shall not. The yeah, I remember that too. Well, Shall not be penalized for, for an absence um, for religious holiday. Uh, well, I'll go back and look. We'll go back and look and see. Cause I thought we were more affirmative than um, just a recommendation of what not to do. Is to this shall not be done. Thank you for catching that, Channel. Uh, any other questions about? And this is open to the board as to whether we have this at all. Um, it's not a required policy. It's recommended policy. I'm not. I'm not seeing any okay. um, strong expressions we'll, of. We'll bring it back next time with the more directive included. Uh, next up is E46 on memorials. Stephen has his hand up. Yep. Oh, uh, so I have concerns with the entire policy. I understand while it's in, in, I reread and reread this many times in light of our current um, um, 
political and racial atmosphere in the United States. I know this is different, but, and I understand why this policy was likely um, created because there are memorial walls and there has to be something governed by it. Um, and I don't mean this to sound harsh, but some may take it that way, but I have to say this, that just because a student or staff member dies in a traumatic event, that might not warrant them being um, memorialized on a wall. So um, uh, I, I, I think in developing this policy, there was a, um, a bias that there are, you know, people are good, well-meaning people. So let me use a specific instance that came to my mind. A student brings a gun into school, shoots people and kills himself. They've died in a, uh, in a, they have died a traumatic death. Do we want to memorialize that person on a memorial wall? And the answer might be yes, but I, I think this, this concept needs to have more informed thought. Chris? Yes, um, 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 so Stephen, you said a more informed what? Well, more inf I, I, I can't, the only thing I can suggest is that it goes back to ground zero and, and starts from the ground up to, to discuss how this is gonna, how this is gonna happen. You know, the, so I don't know, I, I, do, I, I, I just have these concerns. I guess that's the only way I can say it. Thanks. Um, um, sure. Glad uh, you Chris, are. Sure. Yeah. Okay, Jonas also has something. And then Fleur. Sure. Sorry, mute problem. Um, uh, Chris, I mean, if you have something to, uh, to say in response to Stephen, by all means, go ahead. Um, I was, it's going to be more for the board um, as a whole, um, uh, whether they have a sense of wanting to uh, scrap this policy and start over or something else. But your thoughts? Well, I'm what what precipitated this policy to be to begin with why do we need this policy um and and i i, I ask i mean not not to be flip um but um as a preface to saying you know you know grief is important and you know young people's you know experience of of death and dying and trauma um um you know, in a school community is born by the community. Um, and I wish that there was a way, if we need a policy, I wish there was a way to allow the community to memorialize people that have been lost in more of an sort of, in more of an organic, spontaneous way, rather than what seems like a rather rigid a, bureaucratic that's that, that's what i got um Flo, would you mind if jody and steven dellinger pate um, uh, stepped no, in that was uh, that's what i wanted if oh. jody and steven memorial wall that we actually have guiding their process that was my great thanks so jody are you I was waiting to see if Stephen was going to go first. <laughs> um, my understanding of the past was that prior to there being a policy about this, that there were large items that were set up to memorialize folks. And so there would be, there quite honestly could be a ton of benches or other big memorial things all over the campus at this point, had this policy not been put in place. So it's sort of, said yes, we acknowledge that people want to remember folks and, and, and 
um, go through that grief process. And here's how you go about it um, so that we don't have large items scattered all over the campus and no end time to when that would take place and what's the right way to do that. I mean, there's still one thing that's in our, I think somewhere in our building that has been there forever. And I don't know if there's even family left to take it back. I hear that, thanks Jody. Right, and I, I would just add to that is that there was a responsibility at U32 to uh, keep these um, um, in good repair um, was another thing that being uh, put upon the past administrations. And so that uh, led to this policy being adopted is just because of that disparity um, of remembrance and the need to provide upkeep for those things as well. Thank you, both of you. Uh, Lindy, do, oh, and then Stephen Luck, did you have something, Lindy? I, I was thinking it, but I didn't raise my hand. You just read my mind. Uh, there, I, I don't think that, I mean, I don't, I kind of like Stephen, don't want to sound crass or cold or anything else, but I might be able to afford something and my child might have been more popular than somebody else's child. And that also came into play it, when children have, or a teacher. You know, there's very popular teachers and there's not so popular teachers and there's, and I think having a policy helps in that regard as well. Um, because yes, we, we might have those pop up, just like when there's a car accident and a person is killed, a pop up memorial shows up and it goes away, but it's a way for people to show their grief. But there, there was also inequity in how people were remembered. and. I know this from when my older son, a child died while we were on the eighth grade trip. Um, and it was a child under DCF custody who didn't get to go on the trip. And it was, but that child had a very different life than other people in the cohort. And I'm not sure there's any memorial for that child. Um, and I think about that a lot when I, you know, another child who's been something else. I, it's just, lives are, it, it's a very difficult situation. I think a policy helps guide that um, so that we don't end up with things that have to be kept up. Uh, thanks, um, Stephen and then Jonathan. So, uh, so Chris, maybe to go back, I'm, I'm trying to give some more specific guidance. So maybe that second paragraph under philosophy is what's making me feel uneasy. That there should be, I, I, I'm not saying there shouldn't be a memorial space. It should be common. It should be the same for everybody. I, I understand that and the reason for the policy for that, and I support that. But that second short paragraph, which is actually, I think, a sentence, where it says uh, common space designated in the school or on the school grounds where students or staff who die while enrolled or working at the school can be honored. Um, that statement to me suggests that any student or staff who dies when enrolled or working at the school, um, it, it doesn't provide enough to say it just says can be honored. So, so Stephen, I, I wrote in May there. Um, and then I also wrote in um, on the next word, the policy section, um, uh, where it says will be remembered, I put may be remembered. Um, and it kind of gets to your point. I mean, your, your example was extreme, um, but under the policy as written, would have been one where that individual um, despite the harm caused, would be remembered because the word will is a mandatory word. Um, so what, what additional mechanism I think um, needs to be included here, though, is the decider of who will or will not be remembered. Um, because you're adding a discretionary term and someone needs to exercise the discretion. I mean, I'm adding the discretionary term if that's 
kind of addresses your your concerns. Um, or, or the board as a whole says, leave it the way it is. I'm fine with that too. Um, but if we were going to add discretionary terms, we need to also identify the decision maker. And it can be the principal. And, well, you know, may, just, may, I'm sorry, I'm just buttoning in here, but maybe a straw, it, you know, if people aren't bothered by it, and I'm the only one, then we can leave it the way it is. I, I say this many times, everyone can go, Steve, that's not the way we think. So if I'm the only one that feels that, that it has a concern, then it's fine. Let's just leave it the way it is and move on. No, I, um, I think I think it's good to talk it through. I, I have Jonathan and then Gillian. Yeah, my only my only suggestion that I see here, Chris, would be some language that speaks to in consultation with the families or next of kin, um, because it may not be their wishes. For example, that you know they they would for whatever reason may not want a memorial want to keep it private or more private or whatever so I, I i would that would be my suggestion that there would be some language in there and in, that includes in consultation or approval or consent of next of kin or immediate family something like that that would be my suggestion okay. thank you and gillian so my question about this policy, though, is whether or not, um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the woman's name, I'm not even sure if she's still in practice anymore, who does a lot of the grief counseling with children, um, who we unfortunately had come to when I was at Berry City, she came there um, distressingly frequently. Um, and my concern is about developmental appropriateness and about how do these memorials sort of apart from all of the equity concerns, but how do these memorials align with what's best thing, what's best, what's the current sort of best uh, practice in terms of these things, whether or not are we inadvertently traumatizing children by having these, are we inadvertently frightening them? So my, my question is about whether or not um, grief counselors and experts in the field have been consulted? And if they haven't, could we perhaps think about doing that? Thank you. Great. Um, anything else on memorials? I, there, um... yeah, Scott, let's put up two, I would recommend we put up two straw poll. Um, just so if the, if the board as a whole thinks we should not pursue this policy, then we'll know that. Um, uh, just a second, Kat also has something. Oh, I'm sorry, Kat. One question about the policy. It doesn't state what happens to individual memorials that are already in place. Would they have to be taken down? The, there are several memorial benches all around the Calais property and we are a small school. So it's not, we haven't had the same issue that might have been faced at U32 or maybe even Berlin with a number of memorials and to try to think about um, how to make sure everyone is, is supported respectfully and equitably. Um, like my elementary principal has a bench dedicated to her. Um, it's still there and taking it down would just ruin every picture taken there ever. <laughs> so the, the policy doesn't talk about it. So um, okay, thank you. Steve, uh, Stephen Luck. I think it does talk about it in the procedures, if I'm reading it correctly. It says existing memorials will be grandfathered for a period of 12 months from the adoption of this policy. So I would have to take it down after 12 months? But it goes on to explain taking it down and explaining it to the, the family and Oh, there's so, there, anyways, there's there is in some language in there about existing memorials and what would have to happen. This, uh, Lindy, that kind of I don't know if surprises me or whatever, but concerns me because people donate. I mean, I walk on the stow bike path sometimes, and there's all these benches that people have paid for and put on the Stowe bike path so that people can stop and they have a little plaque that says who they're in memory of. And um, 
that's a nice way to have a picnic table at a school or a bench or something that has a different meaning than just our budget could allow us to buy a bench. So I kind of understand Kat's concern if this, if the way that's being read means in 12 months, all those benches have to go away or the memorial part has to be erased. I, I have a problem with that as well. And um, okay, you know what we do? We'll, we'll address the um, various concerns that we've heard in the policy committee and bring back a, um, a, a different type of policy. Um, but do we want to have a straw poll? As to whether we need the policy at all? Um, yes. The, the one problem I'm, I'm sensing that uh, there's, there's sort of at U32, there, um, there seems to be uh, a greater need for such a thing than perhaps in other schools. So uh, if, we, if we abandon the policy altogether, then we might leave U32 in, in sort of a difficult position. Um, Brian. Yeah, I mean, I'm listening to the rich discuss discussion around memorials. And uh, what I think it is, is maybe we need to have more, we have to uh, define a memorial more maybe you have to put an actual i mean we it says memorial isn't someone when someone's passed away but maybe we actually need to define what that memorial maybe more parameters around defining what that could be and that might be a way of of um being uh being able to possibly address uh different schools uh aspects by defining what the memorial could be i mean if you, if you have a perfectly nice park bench <laughs> and kids who are using it people can use it you know, it might be a, a memorial, but it might also serve another function. Why get rid of a bench? I mean, it, it doesn't seem to make any sense. However, I do know that, uh, I know even like, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, as, a, as a child driving down to the New Jersey shore and uh, there were memorials all over the highway. Uh, and it, it was just, it got to a point where you just saw these, you know, highway, you know, that, and they were just, it was very sad. And, and then you realize, 20 years later, you go down and you see these, you see even more. So I think, uh, I think there's, I, don't know, I, th I think, I think it's something to consider, but, but I don't know. I think there's a uh, more work to be done on it. That's what it sounds like. Thank you, Brian. I, I have Stephen Luke and Jonas. As a, as a path forward on this, we frequently discuss um, well, maybe not recently, but in many years that I've been on the board, we've discussed, opportunities to involve the community. And I'm wondering if this might be an example of something that let's slow it down and let's make it a community issue and solicit input from community members, um, make it an opportunity for everyone in all the towns to, to make comments, to, to discuss it, to think about it. Uh, uh, we, we need some guidance, I think, from the school's perspective, but instead of making it, uh, you know, the responsibility of the policy committee, let's make this, let's open this up. It, it involves work, so of course that means I'm automatically volunteering myself, but, <laughs> um, you know, as an opportunity to engage the community, engage community members that are interested in this topic and, and let's not approach it like a typical school board policy committee thing. And let's use it as an opportunity to engage our communities in something I think that's important to many, many people. And maybe it takes a year, a year and a half to resolve it, but it, it's a way to acknowledge that this is an important thing beyond just the school. It involves community members and, and their children and residents and, you know, faculty and staff or, or teachers. And I'm sorry, I talk college language sometimes, but you know what I mean? Um, and, and use it as an opportunity, as an example of something where we can make decisions as an entire community. Good idea. Jonas? Yeah, I, I second what Steven said. I think that's a really good approach. Um, and this has nothing to do with the policy itself. Uh, I just want to point out something that I learned very recently that the phrase grandfather clause or grandfathered has uh, its origin in post-Civil War South 
uh, as part of laws, uh, literacy laws to prevent uh, African Americans from voting. So I would hope, hopefully we can replace that with legacy or legacy or something. Nice, interesting history. Um, so Chris, uh, yeah. what do you think about Stephen's idea? Um, I am open to doing whatever the board would like to do. Um, I don't foresee that happening until the turn of the year because of all the other things that people will be focused on as we reopen the school. Um, so I would suggest that we put it as a future agenda item. Okay. Um, great. Uh, does anybody object? If nobody objects, then we can move on to the next one. And last one, I believe. It's the Memorial Travel Reimbursement Policy. Of course, it would have Just to travel be. Re travel reimbursement. Pretty straightforward. Just sets up the methodology for reimbursing travel within the district. Um, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing thumbs up from Flora and Lindy. Uh, anybody have concerns about this one or questions? I'm not seeing any reactions, Chris. I think you've got a, oh, or Jonas, sorry. Just real quick, do we need to specify that this does not you know, include commuting to work? Um, it, no, because it's for travel on school business and commute is not school business. Good, uh, elegant answer. Okay, um, I, I'm not otherwise seeing any uh, any appetite for discussion of travel reimbursement. I think you have a keeper there. So um, okay. thank you very much. So um, that, that was very interesting, actually. That was. Um, yeah. Um, so we're now at the consent agenda. And we have the minutes of June 17th and July 1st to approve. Um, I, I suggest just approving them uh, single motion to approve both minutes. Anybody up for that? Um, Diane, Diane moves. Uh, any second? Second. Floor seconds. Um, very good. Thank you. Discussion? They look good? Great. As always, thank you very much, Lisa. Great job. Um, all in favor, please click your yes button. And if you're opposed, your no. And um, I'm seeing only yeses. So the motion carries. Um, as for board orders, um, if anybody has them handy, whoever does have them handy, could you please read them out for um, Lisa and for anybody who is listening to this? So I, I have them. I have them here, and I have two different board orders. Uh, the first is in the amount of eleven million two hundred ninety-three thousand thirty-seven dollars and one cent. And the second is in the amount of $156,482.19. And is that for, uh, for what date is that, Chris? The date range uh, for the uh, $11 million number is for um, 61820 to 62420. Uh, well, actually, there are a number of different dates. Um, 618.20 to 624.20 uh, for two of the, of the uh, warrants. One for 610.2020 uh, uh, to BMO, all caps. And then another warrant for 625.20 to 630.20. And another warrant in the, for 625.20 to 630.20. And the, the com combination of those different warrants totaled eleven million two hundred ninety-three thousand thirty-seven dollars and one cent. And then the other warrant uh, for the one hundred fifty-six thousand four hundred eighty-two dollar and nineteen cent um, 
is for from July 1, 2020 through July 15, 2020 for two different entries. Okay. Um, Lisa, got that? Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. Is there a second? Lindy seconds. Great. Okay. Um, any discussion? I, I would like to just ask about, I assume it's hardware, but I don't know, custom computer for $39,000. Was that for computer hardware? Yes, that was laptops, replacement laptops for this coming school year. Okay, thanks. She was testing you, Keith, to see if you were listening. <laughs> Great. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, all in favor of approving the board orders as moved by Chris and seconded by Lindy, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And um, I'm seeing, again, only yeses. I'm voting yes, Scott, even though I can't get my button going. Okay, I, I, I'm actually seeing it flickering there, Chris. Oh, so, okay, yeah. there you go. Thank now you. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. Great, okay. So, um, future agenda items. We have uh, a number of these. We have um, the uh, memorials um, question, yes, that we were just discussing. Uh, yeah. Is there personnel action to be taken? Oh my gosh, thank you so much, <laughs> Lisa. There is, um, page 59, thank you. Um, let me just go there. Right, um, from what I'm seeing, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there are only a group of retirements only. Um, we can move them, I believe, as as a group, if someone would like to do the honors. I'll do that. Um, I move that we accept the recommended retirements that will be effective June 30th, 2021. Do I need to list the names? Um, maybe mention them just okay. again for, yeah. thank you. Uh, Susan Price at U32, Sue Ann Mayette, at U32, Jane Badger at East Montpelier, and Catherine Stone at East Montpelier. Thank you, Lindy. Um, uh, Diane, are you seconding? Great, thanks. And you also have a comment. I'm assuming, and maybe I shouldn't be assuming, but these are early retirement people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, I can uh, just provide some more background. So uh, the early retirement uh, was sent out to 55 people. Uh, so far, 13 have responded. Out of the uh, five accepted and eight have declined. Uh, they have until September 15th to make their decision. So we're waiting to hear back from 42 people. And uh, the, the original projection, as it was told to me, was a uh, 22 may take, up to 22, around 22 may take it. Thank you. Right, thanks. Um, uh, others, other questions? If not, we can go to a vote. All in favor of, um, of accepting the retirements as moved by Lindy and seconded by Diane, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And I see all the yeses again. And once more, thank you, Lisa, for catching me on that. Um, right, now, uh, future agenda items. Um, I'm, I have three um, in my head, and, and please um, fill in any blanks. I have memorials, energy consultant, and uh, Act 46 sort of cleanup. Um, does anybody have anything else? Yes. Uh, Chris. Search for Lori Bebo's replacement. Ah, uh, my God, of course. 
That's a big one. Thank you. Um, anyone else have anything? Um, not, not for future uh, agenda, um, but I would like to address something that's in the chat. Um, there have been a number of questions uh, typed out in the chat tonight from a, from a few different people. Uh, I think they're all well considered and, and very thoughtful. Um, and you know, with, you know, with really with all due respect, I don't think the chat is a great venue for communicating um, between ourselves or with the public during these meetings. Um, I think it's it's distracting and. Um, there, there are venues for uh, for getting this, you know, stuff into the into the written record. I know that we're in, trying to include the chats on the record, but the thing that Corinne just posted, uh, I think, is 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 worth making. Um, Corinne's question about um, um, about you know what the plan is and if there are outbreaks and does the board have discretion to close schools, uh, you know, even if the state, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if the agency doesn't want to, or the Department of Health, you know, do we have that power? Those are things that, 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 that I don't know. Um, Brian, I don't know if, if, if you know them. Um, but then it, what, what I really wanted to uh, address is, um, you know, asking for confirmation of what was told July 1st that families who choose not to send their children will be able to do remote learning in conjunction with the school as opposed to needing to homeschool. I don't think that that's been decided yet, and I just read through the minutes of July 1st, and I can't find any reference to where anyone um, from the district said that that is what is going to happen. Corinne, I also hope that that's what's going to happen, but to my knowledge, that has not been decided and, and was not presented as a decision that had been made on July 1st. There, Jonas, this is Diane. There was a statement made, though. Brian did make a statement that, um, you know, because there was a concern as to whether or not families would have to choose homeschooling. And so it was in response to that that um, we would be uh, responsive to families' needs and would be uh, providing those options. I can't remember the exact wording of it, but it, there was definitely a statement made. Okay. I'm not. Uh, yeah. I'm not seeing. Sorry, I'm not seeing that in the minutes, and that's that's also not my recollection. My recollection is that it was um, still up in the air, and and that nothing had been nailed down. Yeah, Ryan, I wonder I can, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I can just uh, also say that uh, uh, there was a, a gentleman in the, in the audience who had uh, asked, and I and I did not commit any anything to that because I didn't have the guidance. But I did say that uh, if remote learning was a possibility, uh, we would definitely explore it. I didn't I didn't guarantee that that's what we could do because I didn't have the guidance. Uh, so I didn't want to commit to that because it's hard to do that when you don't know what the state is going to direct uh, give you that guidance around. So, so that raises, I think, the question as to whether there would be remote learning for parents who chose, if, this, if the state um, said schools are going to open for in-person learning and some parents decided to not send their children to school, um, would, they be, would there be access for remote learning for those parents? And I think it was Dave Lawrence who raised that, if I'm not mistaken. And David, if you're on the line, um, either correct me or, or weigh in if you can, because I thought it was you that raised the question. Yeah, once again, this is um, not David Lawrence, obviously, but once again, I, I find it interesting how the future agenda items circle back to the present agenda item. Um, Excuse me, may I comment? Uh, is that Corinne? It's Corinne. Please. So at the end of the meeting, I had specifically asked, what about parents who didn't want to send? And that was when Brian questioned whether I was talking homeschooling or remote learning. And after I said, I'm talking about remote learning, I absolutely know what homeschooling is. Dave Lawrence spoke back up because he had made a comment at the beginning of the meeting and so he said, oh, I want to clarify, it is absolutely 
the remote learning that I would be interested in doing in conjunction with the school. And so if you all take a few minutes to watch the end of the July 1st meeting, you will say that you will see that was given as a that can happen. That's all uh, I'll say. I think I think the intent there was uh, ultimately to say that I, I would prefer to have remote learning than homeschooling. I think that was the intent. So, uh, but I, I didn't commit to anything because we ultimately, it's very hard to commit to anything without having the guidance. Um, thank um, you. Um, can I just, Jill, uh, Stephen, I just want, I would, yeah, I just wanted to suggest, I, I think that Brian has, has reminded us multiple times during this meeting that he's just recent, just today in receipt of the hybrid model guidance and really needs to absorb it and make sense of it so that we can have a more, I think, practical and thoughtful conversation about this. So clearly that needs to happen. And it sounds like, you know, he's only just gotten what uh, he needs for that. So um, I, I, I had every expectation that we would be having that conversation and learning more about that based on his comment that we, we now have this memo in hand, this new guidance. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. And um, if I may, I, I, remember, sorry, Scott, I just looked at yeah, the go ahead. Orca video at two hours, 29 minutes and about 30 seconds uh, is when Brian starts talking about this. And I think he's clearly saying that's one of the options that we will explore. I hear no commitment. Okay, good. Um, Stephen Mook. I'd like to bring us back to what was originally discussed, how we're going to handle chat questions. Um, and this is a, a, perhaps part of what Jonas was getting at when he first brought it up. It, it, it can get us shooting in all kinds of directions all over the place. What, if it's an appropriate ask, I would ask the uh, agenda committee or whatever that group is called to just <laughs> To, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be flip, okay. like, okay. what it's called. Okay. Um, to, at their next agenda meeting, to <laughs> discuss how as a board we're gonna handle chat amongst ourselves and amongst the community and come forward with a recommendation as a future agenda item. Um, I, I did, I, it's, 10 o'clock, I don't want to start looking at 52 chats and deciding what we're going to do. Let's come up with an approach on how we're going to handle chat, bring it up as a future agenda item. We'll talk about it. We'll make a decision. This is what we're going to do. And then we can move forward. Uh, yeah. Stephen, I, can, I, can I also just uh, chime in? And uh, I also think uh, in, in, in thinking about uh, the district and uh, it, obviously a board meeting, you definitely want to get uh, illicit uh, information from members of the public at certain times during the meeting. Uh, and so I would definitely, uh, it would look like to look into, you know, making sure that whatever we do or get some, maybe some legal parameters around what we can or cannot do with the, with the chat, because uh, I do think that should be something that needs to be looked at. Great. I, uh, so uh, a future agenda item, the what to do about the chat. Great. Um, anything else that anybody has? Fleur? It, could, we, could we potentially add uh, the VSBA dues? Sure. For future items? Yes. Thank you. And then of course. Uh, I just, uh, if we're done with that, I just have a comment. Um, are we done then with future agenda items? I think we are. Uh, wait, wait, Scott, can I just, I'm sorry, it's Jill. I just wanted to clarify okay. I, what I heard Stephen suggesting was that the um, agenda committee take the first crack at thinking about what to do with the chat. So yes, it would be a future agenda item, but that it would actually be one that that committee would consider. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, which I thought made sense as a process. Yeah. It's great. Thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, we're done with future agenda items. So, Fleur, uh, comment. I, I, I just, I just had a comment that you know, in the way that we've been going back and forth the conversation, that I, I think we every time we have these meetings and for the public and us that, that just remind ourselves that we're going to have to constantly pivot and change through this. So to hold people accountable, we we can't have a linear approach at what how we're dealing 
with COVID-19 right now. So, you know, just remind ourselves that we're going to have to be flexible, a little bit more flexible than before. That's, that's all, you know, we're going to be constantly making decisions that we might have to change the next day. So that's all. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for that. Um, if uh, nobody else has a comment, we can adjourn by consensus before the clock strikes 10. Um, no objection? Thank then, you for your support, everyone. <laughs> and you too, Brian, all of you. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You. Have a good night.